Let's see how it looks. No, I guess not. You're more, yeah, you're absolutely more than welcome. Oh, really? Stay in that position and just clench your eyes over and have the monitor to your right. Oh, okay. That's right. Don't lean forward. Don't lean forward. Oh, don't lean forward. Don't lean forward. Don't lean forward. Don't lean forward. Okay. Are you happy with that? Yeah, I can. There's no way I can. I can't lose 20 pounds in 20 years in this in five minutes. So. It looks really nice. We've got a real dramatic shadow on the. Okay, I like that. Because we lost 20 years. We're too young for the demo. Five. That's all right. Uh, ready? I can't. I have to aim for. Let me take the last swig. Uh, no less than authority that I believe Kerrang Magazine uh, said that when you meeting me love was. One of the most important moments in history. No, no, no. Spin Magazine. Spin? Spin Magazine. The 100 Greatest Moments in the History of Rock and Roll, number seven, to be specific, was Me, 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 Love. Kerrang! Magazine is noteworthy because I got to be in the cover. And Kerrang! actually always was great. And Kerrang!'s gotten bigger and bigger. It's uh, now the biggest music magazine in the UK. Take me back to that moment and explain what actually happened because, you know, it's gone down many ways, including you saying, you know, Mr. Loaf, I presume. Uh, kind of uh, historic uh, importance. What what was the moment when you two met? We met uh, when Meatloaf auditioned for me. It was uh, I was doing a show that I wrote the music and lyrics for at the Shakespeare New York Shakespeare Festival. Oh God, I don't even remember what year. It was probably like 1972, uh, 73, one of those two years. And uh, he came in and auditioned. It was just we saw like 2,000, 3,000 people. He came in one day. Uh, and I thought he was, from the minute he walked in, I was stunned. I thought he was astonishing. He's just one of those people who walks in and it's the equivalent of an enormous cat pissing on the door. Uh, it just stakes territory immediately. He, just charismatic and, and, and he wasn't the character of Meatloaf then. He was much more like this enormous inflated farm boy. He wore like overalls. He didn't have that much experience singing rock and roll specifically. He had done hair on stage. Mostly he sang gospel and blues, which is what he grew up learning and knowing. And he came in with this amazing accompanist, who I still work with, named Steve Margotius, uh, incredible pianist. And uh, he sang a song called You Gotta Give Your Heart to Jesus, because uh, he sang all gospel and blues. And uh, I just remember thinking, this is the most amazing presence and voice that I've encountered ever. Uh, it was pretty natural for me because I grew up with opera and Wagner was my hero. And Meatloaf was like all the operatic stars. He was, you know, they play Siegfried, who's a 16-year-old sort of Brad Pitt character, but they're all like 400 pounds. So it didn't bother me the way, it was perfectly natural. And when he sang, it was mind-boggling. Uh, this huge volcanic eruption of sound that was totally awesome in that you could feel the room shake. Uh, this is something Actually, no one can tell from the records. It's odd, but I don't think the records have ever captured Meat's voice the way it was. We would rehearse in a room where you, a smaller room than where he auditioned. And in the room, you could totally feel the piano shake, the chair shake. It was, it was a physical phenomenon. And I also loved the way he performed physically. His eyes would disappear. You couldn't see anything but the whites of his eyes. They would roll up to the top of his head, so he sort of had a little Linda Blair thing going. And plus, his, he'd do amazing things with his hands. They would convulse in, like while he was singing in a strange sort of rhythm and counterpoint uh, and he basically seemed possessed and sang this song you gotta give your heart to Jesus amazingly and when it was done I was just dumbstruck and I remember at the end of the day everyone gathers the director, producer, uh, writers to discuss the people you've seen who auditioned and I was the only one who had him down on my list I said well what about that guy Meatloaf and it seemed very natural to me to say Meatloaf, strange enough from the minute I met him. I, I don't know why, but I was the only one who didn't make jokes about his name. And nobody else had him on the list. And I remember them all saying, Meatloaf? That big fat guy? There's no part for him. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. And I said, we got to write a part for him. He's just astonishing. And it was a big fight, but we ended up writing a part for him that didn't exist. It was a show about Vietnam. And he played um, a soldier in Vietnam who was prone to throw hand grenades at his superior officers. And um, it was just a stunning moment. I'll never forget it. Because I, I needed someone to sing my songs. I had always thought I would sing my own songs. I come out of college and I had Robert Stigwood as a manager, who at the time was Eric Clapton in the Bee Gees. 
and I, of course, was right up there with Eric Clapton and the Bee Gees. I was number three. And uh, I was going to be a singer and a songwriter, but I had gotten into a terrible medical problem with uh, broken bones in my nose, and uh, it was too complicated to go into. But um, I couldn't sing, basically. It was too excruciating and painful. And when he came in, it was like a gift from the gods. Like they had sent someone who could sing far better than I could. And who actually was the only person I could imagine on earth who had the perfect voice for what I was imagining. Let's go back to who you were when you two met, because you, were, you had this astonishing, uh, you know, Joseph Papp. I wonder if you could explain who Joseph, for people who don't know who well, Joseph Papp was and how you two met. Joseph Papp, in historical in terms of theater, is sort of messianic legendary figure. He came to prominence in New York City in the 50s. He was a great populist. That's what was wonderful about him. And his first really, his great visionary thought was that Shakespeare shouldn't be at all elitist. And he worked his ass off to get Shakespeare done in Central Park for free, which is still being done every summer at the place called the Delacorte Theater. And he was a tireless promoter of populist art and a tireless fundraiser, which was tied to it. Yeah, and he was able to raise money and build up the New York Shakespeare Festival gradually from a nothing operation in, I think, Brooklyn to this pretty big organization in New York. And not only doing shows in the park, but they had the New York Shakespeare Festival, which is still downtown in New York in Lafayette Street. And he got a real sort of charge when uh, he put on hair in 1967 or 68 off-Broadway, and it became a sensation, it ended up on Broadway, and then permeated the culture. And it was really one of the first times, I guess, in a long time that a musical had permeated the culture. That it sort of stopped in the early 60s with West Side Story, Sound of Music, that era. And pretty much you could say the Beatles had a lot to do with that. You know, music changed and theater music was sort of archaic and didn't fit the contemporary pulse. But Hare brought it back to relating to the culture. And Pap was just uh, messianic in wanting to bring theater to a mass audience, and Shakespeare particularly. And, and I identified with him immediately because he saw no difference between Shakespeare and Hare, basically. Uh, it was all theater. And I grew up with opera and rock and roll and didn't see any difference. Uh, it was all just sensation to me and uh, intensity and mythology and everything cool. And um, Pat became sort of my surrogate dad. He, he loved being a mentor to people. And he sort of took me in. He saw a show I did in college, in my senior year at Amherst College. I did this thing called The Dream Engine, which was a three-hour rock epic with tons of nudity. It was everything I dreamed of. It got closed down by the police, written up in, in the newspapers, caused a sensation, and Pap came to see it, and at the um, intermission, he signed it up, which was really cool. It was like one of those legendary stories. He was in the um, dressing room, and I remember signing the paper. I didn't know what I was signing. <laughs> I just said, what the hell? It's better than going to graduate school, studying film. That's what I was going to do. And um, I also remember we were all nude, because the second act was almost all nudity. <laughs> so there's like 20 people nude standing around Joe Pat signing. Which I think it's the only time he signed a contract with 20 people nude, at least that he admitted. And um, uh, that started me out on theater, which I really hadn't set my mind that clearly to do. But I said, well, this is a great opportunity. And so we went right from my school to New York City to break into the world of big time showbiz and theater. And I had a lot to learn about that. There was like seven year journey working with Pap and never getting that show on. Uh, it started with the fact that there was a mayoralty election in 1970, the first year I got to New York. And the city council wouldn't okay this. He, wanted, he had a great idea. He wanted the Dream Engine to be done with the original cast of college kids in the Central Park Theater where they did Shakespeare, which was a brilliant idea because it was an amazing production. Um, a lot better than most of the stuff I see still today in New York. Uh, and um, he thought it would be just, you know, no problem, because they had never questioned anything, because it had always been Shakespeare. But the, for the first time, the city council read it and said, no way, it's too sexual, too violent, far more nudity than Antony and Cleopatra has. <laughs> and uh, amazing enough, I don't think they ever read Shakespeare. I think they would have turned down a lot of Shakespeare. But so he couldn't do it in Central Park, and I stayed with him for seven years working on other things, including the musical in which I met Meat Love, called More Than You Deserve. But I never uh, got to do the Dream Engine. And the Dream Engine was really the seeds of the vision of Bat Out of Hell for me, creatively. And Meatloaf became the physical ve uh, vessel through which I could get that across. 
So it was really those two forces, what I brought with me from growing up and from school and Joe Pab, ending up meeting Meatloaf. Uh, was a, that's why spin, I guess, you know, hyperbolically called it the number seven great moment in rock and roll, was it allowed us to work together and in their perspective created a whole form. Forgetting, forgetting, I'm sorry, we're just It's actually, if you want to describe the talent of Gowd or Upper West. Sure. Forgetting what Spin says, because I worked for Rolling Stone, I yeah. forget what Spin mm -hmm. says. For you, how important was that moment? Well, at the time, it wasn't important at all, except that I had seen this big, huge actor that I thought would be good in the play. Uh, so, it's like everything. It's like everything's going to be during this interview. At the time, nothing seemed that significant, because <laughs> it's at the time. Um, everything comes with perspective, looking back. Um, it was basically significant to me, because I found someone who could sing my music the way I always envisioned it. Uh, uh, at the most immediate purpose was, hey, this guy could be in the show. I could sing a great song, which hadn't been written, nor had the character, but he embodied what I was trying to get at theatrically. I mean, my whole thing was I was really looking for a fusion of theater and rock and roll. I'd grown up with them both, and they really didn't exist, and I thought Hair was pretty ridiculous for me. The show I did actually was done at the same time in school as Hair, but the Dream Engine was pretty prophetic. I, I still think it's the best thing I'll ever do. And um, it's all been downhill from there. <laughs> it's the one thing I share with Orson Welles, <laughs> is that we did our best thing first. And um, it, was, it was extraordinary, it was because hair was this, you know, flowers and all sentimentality and love children. Dream Engine was about a really violent pack of kids, and it actually, though it came before it, almost eerily prophesied Kent State Massacre with uh, soldiers shooting and killing all these kids, but also prophesied the Manson murders, in that it had the kids who were the heroes, they had, I don't want to get into the plot, but basically they had separated from the rest of the country. Uh, there had been an earthquake and California was severed from the country. And there was one huge city in California which was run by a conglomerate of the church, the police, and big business, who were the villains. And, um, and the kids were basically like the Lost Boys. It was all sort of a uh, science fiction version of Peter Pan. And that was, that's always been my biggest vision. It's like, it's like a... Um, I, I, it's sort of like this huge breast that I suckle on. <laughs> Everything I take is somewhat related to my Peter Pan vision. That's Neverland. Now, yeah. It seems like everything that we know in your career seems to have some tie back to Neverland. The, the good stuff does. Um, that's because I've been wanting to do that now for 30 years. I just haven't gotten to it. Um, it's my favorite story of all time. I'm sorry, if you could say Peter Pan. Yeah, Peter Pan is like my favorite story of all time. I mean, of great mythic. I mean, you know, the old tale are only three or to five great stories, Romeo and Juliet, etc. I think Peter Pan is definitely one of the three to five great stories. And for me, it was one of the great stories partly because it was the greatest rock and roll myth, myth I could think of. Um, I mean, when you think about it, it's, it, first of all, it's a lot darker than people realize. I have no idea why Peter Pan became what it became with, for those who grew up my generation was Mary Martin, this butch lesbian playing in the mid-50s, flying around. Now it's Kathy Rigby. I don't know if she's a lesbian, but she's just as worthless. <laughs> I mean, why they had a woman playing this boy, I never knew. And um, I was always so fascinated with the idea of, first of all, it's about gangs. I love the West Side Story. And when you think about it, Peter Pan is nothing but a battle of gangs. Indians, mermaids, ty uh, pirates, lost boys, and they're all fighting over turf which is Neverland, and the greatest thing is that there are these boys who don't grow up, which is the ultimate rock and roll mythology. And uh, it's also one of the cruelest stories ever, uh, the romance between Peter and Wendy. There's no colder moment that I know of than when he comes back to take ne Wendy to Neverland, but he's forgotten that 30 years have passed, and he just says, no, you're too old. I can't take you, you're too old. And she's like 31 or something. Um, but. I was always entranced by that story and always wanted to do it as a rock and roll, sort of science fiction epic. And that was what the Dream Engine sort of was, the first incarnation of it. Which begs the question of, I'm as big a Bad Eye Hell fan as anyone. I bought, I think, 12 copies over the years, and I'm a rock critic, so for me to actually buy records means hmm. something. But I've always wondered, from your point of view, how much is that a rock opera, or a, how much of a story, a concept is that? Because I've always seen it as, the concept to me was your psyche being expressed really powerfully. 
it is more just my psyche than it's one concept. It's not one story. In a way, I think of every song is a story. It's almost to me like, if you take my example of Peter Pan as a great story, if you interviewed each of the Lost Boys, they'd each have a song on Battle of the Hell, each one of them. It's, it's basically a collection of stories. Um, it's like a mosaic. Uh, but if you put it all together, it's part of the world that I love, which is the world of Lost Boys and Peter Pan and Neverland, the place where kids don't grow up, and what results from that. I mean, the thing that I loved about it is that I didn't find that to be a light or a sentimental idea. I took it literally. I thought it was actually a great science fiction concept that if a kid was 18 for 80 years, what would he be like? And I thought that was a great subject for science fiction. For one thing, uh, I thought he'd end up like Caligula, totally insane and mad. Because if you're 18, you've got to have sensation and excitement and thrills like every second. And everything is life or death and urgent and, and it's all, you know, so primal and important. And if you do that for 80 years, you're going to be exhausted and you're going to be almost totally insane trying to find new excitement, new thrills, new ways to ignite passion. And on the other hand, you have to ask yourself, do you change at all? If you live 80 years, do you become wiser through experience or because you have an 18 year old's soul and brain and body, do you stay 18? I thought it was an interesting subject. The album, Bad Hell, has a sort of Peter Pan quality in that every generation rediscovers it. Now that happened with the Grateful Dead for a long time, but that was helped by pot, uh, you know, going along with it. But Bat of Hell, even the kids who didn't smoke pot seem to go through, it's part of your rite of passage now to discover, you know, it's always been to discover that record. What about it speaks to teenagers? Because it seems like the sexuality of it, the humor of it, the drama of it, the gothicness, all seem, your, there's part of your soul that seems perennially teenage. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, totally retarded. I mean, I haven't gotten beyond 18. Um, but I think it's, you know, to use the old cliche, it speaks to the teenager and everyone. I think, to me, the teenage aspect of everyone is the most attractive element. Um, I mean, one of the, the lyrics I wrote on Battle of Hell 2 was actually very profoundly sincere, uh, that a, a wasted youth is better by far than a wise and productive old age. And I really believe that. I mean, I'd rather be an 18 year old wasted kid than Morley Safer any day. <laughs> Not to pick on Morley Safer, <laughs> except I'd rather be him than Andy Rooney. <laughs> it could have been worse. Um, I just think that the teenage aspect of people is the greatest thing. How it's channeled is multivaried and can be horrible, great, or whatever. But holding on to whatever that is, is to me really cool and valuable and important as you grow older. And so I think it was si simply speaking to what I actually think is the most primal elements of everybody. I'm always amazed to an extent that Battle of Hell is such a big teenage album because half the songs in it are ballads and to me pretty sophisticated and mature. I mean, my favorite song in the record is the final song for Crying Out Loud, which is hardly a teenage song, but still fits into that world because it's life or death and urgent and it lives in the moment. And um, you know, the Grateful Dead needed pot, I guess, to fuel it, so this needed semen. <laughs> it's just a different particular drug. <laughs> um, it's just about very basic, primal, physical, and emotional things carried to an extreme. Um, basically, to me, the key of the record is I was trying to do something that was myth mythic, and I love mythology. And I love the mythology of rock and roll, and there are different ways to approach rock and roll, obviously, a lot of them. And some doc rock and roll is to me what I'd call documentary or confessional. You know, I was writing this at the time that artists, sing singer-songwriters like Joni Mitchell, James Taylor, and Jackson Brown were really big. That was the exact opposite of my world. Um, I remember auditioning for Warner Brothers in Los Angeles with my show, The Dream Engine. It was one of the most excruciating experiences of my life. All my trips to Los Angeles were excruciating. It was like it was another culture. Um, they didn't at that time, it was like 30 people from Warner Brothers all the top people, and they hated when I did this audition of the show. For one thing, they didn't really know what the concept of a show is. They couldn't get around the idea that there were characters singing, which was one of the good things that Bad Out of Hell did, I think. There were other records before it that did it, but it wasn't the person singing like Joni Mitchell sang about her life. This was characters singing, and uh, they didn't understand that. So if someone sang a vicious lyric as a vicious character, they'd be totally baffled. 
And they would, I remember the first comment after the edition was over, <laughs> when I knew it wasn't a great deal with Warner Brothers, was this guy stood up and said, you know, we don't need people like you in this world. And they since usually teach that that's not a good entree to a great deal. <laughs> and they were very offended and pompous about it, like, because they went to a whole other thing. They went to James Taylor. And that, did that come back to bite you with uh, yeah. Could you dab, dab? Yeah, just tell me. The weird thing for me was I was a big fan of Warner Brothers yeah. Records and the Beach Boys and all the people Lenny Warrenker worked with. That's why it was kind of shattering to me. Um, Lenny Warrenker was mainly upset when we did a personal audition for him. That's jumping ahead. That was Bad of the Hell after it was finished, if you want me to jump ahead. Um, it was a finished record, all mixed, and Warner Brothers still wouldn't accept it. It had been done for Todd Rundgren's label that he had with Albert Grossman, Bearsville. And uh, when it was all finished, and we thought we finally had it, Warner Brothers said, you know, uh, we're not going to do much with Bearsville. This record uh, is a uh, big enterprise. We're going to have to approve it. So come out and do a live audition. This is after the record's completely done. We had to do another live audition, me and Meatloaf at the piano, and Ellen Foley, the girl who was with us. And we did it at Lenny Warrenker's office, this little office, and a little upright piano. And he had all the pictures of his family on the piano, like 35 photographs, all the grandchildren, kids, whatever they were. I don't know, foster children. It was just like this massive amount of beautiful little photographs. And I knew that was going to be a problem because I pounded the piano so hard. You never wanted to put anything on it. And I was pounding away, and Meatloaf was howling, and all of a sudden, all the photographs fell off the piano. Just like, um, like stoned koala bears on a tree in Australia going, oh, geez, oh. And they just fell off the piano and fell on the floor, and Lenny was horrified. And I just kept playing, and you could see all these, his whole family just lying on the floor in a rubble, a sort of mini Bosnia. And um, uh, that's one of the reasons I think he didn't like it. <laughs> but nobody from Warner Brothers did, except, um, which I'll never forget, Mo Austin was one of the greatest people I've ever met in music. He was sort of the father of Warner Brothers. And um, he liked it. He actually apologized to me. He said, I can't sign this because I had 40 people there and 37 of them hated it. And 11 actually said they'd quit the company if I signed it. He said, that doesn't order well for the support I get from the company. He said, but um, I liked it. And he said, um, one other person liked it. You won't know who he is, but... He, he was sitting outside because he hates auditions, he wouldn't come in, but this fellow named Randy Newman liked it. And Randy Newman was one of my heroes, uh, so that was nice to know. But everyone else hated it and um, had no luck out there. But we had no luck in general with Bad of the Hell. It was beyond belief an uphill battle uh, against actually very deep-seated prejudices and, and hatreds. I mean, people truly hated it, which was, for me, kind of exhilarating. I mean, it, I love ecstatic reactions or vicious, hateful reactions. I get nervous with just, hey, that's pretty good. Uh, but, um... That's the Brechtian uh, part of it. <laughs> I just like extremism. Before we get back into chronology, you mentioned Randy Newman. I just did this show with him, like, uh, two weeks ago, and he, I, I mentioned him that he was the guy that really introduced humor into rock and roll, and he goes, yeah, see how well that did. Uh, because <laughs> people hate humor in rock and roll because it's contrary to the beat. You know, you can't laugh and get into the beat. Do you, you are, I think, were, were at, you know, after him were really, I, I think one of the sort of un, the, uh, secret weapons about Battered Hell, and uh, Todd has spoken, is to the wit of it and the humor. Oh yeah, I, I don't think, Todd definitely, uh, Todd will probably explain it as the one reason he could get through the ordeal <laughs> was the humor. I never thought it was a secret weapon, I always thought it was a hilarious record. But I, I didn't think of that in a kind of ha-ha way. I mean, to me, the best comedy, you can't quite distinguish it from what's around it. I mean, I, I still, you know, Hitchcock was my other hero. Um, if I was thinking of my heroes, they were like, you know, uh, Elvis, the Beatles, Little Richard, Jimi Hendrix, Hitchcock. And I remember when they all jammed together, too. <laughs> it was an amazing scene. Hitchcock on bass, amazing. Um, but th the thing about Hitchcock, his movies were so inspiring to me that I really think, far more than any of the musical instances, I think I construct my songs Hitchcockian way, at least I try to. I can't reach his level, but um, what was brilliant about him to me was his movie, not one of his movies isn't funny. My favorite film of all time is Psycho. I've seen Psycho 23 times now. I think that's the only movie, it's like I always think if you have to pick one thing to teach, I liked it as an exercise. And if you have to teach film, to me, you don't have to go anywhere beyond Psycho. You could just watch that 1,000 times and each time find something new to tell people about. Everything, more than Citizen Kane, to me, and more than anything Spielberg ever do, it's in Psycho. 
And the great thing about Psycho is that it's a comedy. I mean, if you're defining Psycho, my first thing would be to say it's a black comedy. A wonderful black comedy about America, about motherhood. It's the best comedy about motherhood that I know of. And um, all his films are like that, though. Every one I love. And they're all comic in the same moments that they're horrifying. Um, partly because of the extremism, again. And partly because his perspective. He was always in a place you didn't expect. The camera was. And, um, and he also, the way he would, you know, I'll tell you, it's so specific that the way Bad Out of Hell, the song, unfolds to me is very much like Psycho unfolds visually. Psycho begins, if you watch it, with a long shot of Arizona, a uh, long shot of the whole city, and then the camera goes into one area, and then one building on one block, and then through the window of that building to you see Janet Leigh and John Gavin in bed, uh, nude, having sex. And it's the voyeuristic thing, the fact that you started with like what seems like a satellite shot of the whole state of Arizona, or at least the whole city of Phoenix, but you end up in this bedroom. Uh, Bad Out of Hell starts with a similar situation. You know, the sirens are screaming and the fires are howling way down in the valley tonight, and it keeps getting closer and closer until it ends up with these two kids, uh, basically in bed, so to speak. Um, and I, I just find those things were probably, you know, not conscious, but to me, the way Hitchcock constructs things is the greatest. And part of it is the humor. Is that, you know, it's not jokes. It's just part of the fiber of it. And also, it's partly the extremism. I mean, my songs uh, wasn't a conscious ever, but they're so extreme that, to me, they're funny by definition. Because they're so beyond the boundary of where they should go. And I think that the lunacy of comedy and the lunacy of ecstasy are very closely connected. The show, this show that's going to be on for Ultimate Albums and no album is more ultimate than this one. Were you trying to make, in a way, the greatest, you know, the epic, the ultimate? Rock oh, album? no, I wasn't trying to make the greatest. I, I didn't have a goddamn clue what the hell I was doing. I was trying to get just from one chord to the other. I never intended to make records at all. Um, I intended to do film or theater, so it was all a surprise to me. And so it was an adventure, but I didn't have any sense of that. I just knew that I had a vision for it, which looking back at it was completely insane. I mean, it's seven songs and almost all of them are like eight or nine minutes. I certainly didn't have much sense of what radio was playing uh, or editing, that kind of thing. And most of them were edited anyway. They were seven minutes of the album, but I thought of that as the single edit. They were 20 minutes when I wrote them. Um, I was just trying to get across what I'd been trying to get across when I was writing plays and anything else. It was, I was trying to tell great stories and be very theatrical and not be real. That was, I think, the main impulse. I, I never liked realism much, and um, that's another reason I love Hitchcock. Because the one thing you could say about Psycho is it doesn't feel real, it feels like a dream. And I always thought the greatest music for me and the greatest theater and movies never felt real. They felt like you were entrapped in their own kingdom of dreams, and it had that, that kind of logic. And all my, it's going back to, you can pick Alice in Wonderland, I, I know that all my favorite works are like that. And um, I think that was the difference, you know, at the time I was working, Springsteen was doing stuff, and uh, there were a lot of comparisons. But I, I strangely enough, never saw that, because I always thought that Springsteen stuff, which I adored at the time, um, was much more like, well, in film terms, it would be like Martin Scorsese and Mean Streets. It was sort of confessional documentarian. It was, again, more like the music Joni Mitchell was doing. It was very personal and very confessional and real, and I could always... I could never imagine Springsteen's songs in color. They were always in black and white to me. Great black and white. And I could never imagine my songs in black and white. They were always in lurid color, kind of like the color Fellini, or um, anything extravagantly colorful. Um, just extreme and, um, and hallucinatory and, and, and mythic, as opposed to realistic. <coughs> well, there's the show. There's an um, the, uh, Let's go back into chronology. How did, how did you and, and <clears throat> Love decide to throw your lot together? The way he tells it, <coughs> he pursued you and would not let you get away from him. But what's the truth about how you guys, you seem like an unlikely, one of, I see this record as like a Wagnerian, odd, you know, buddy comedy. You know, the, yeah, that's between good. these two really yeah. unlikely guys from different backgrounds. Totally. How did you throw your lot together? Uh, I don't know how he sees it. It was actually a very natural thing in that we had him, he, got him in this play, what he deserved, and I was just astounded by his talent and his voice, and it was great for me. 
to write for and to create for, and we started talking about doing a record. And neither of us knew really what that meant, but um, I started writing songs. I never had to change my style of songwriting. It's just that it probably became more specific because I knew who I was writing for. And there was, um, there was a physical embodiment of what I was thinking of. Uh, but I don't remember him pursuing me. I mean, he was very determined as I was. So in a sense, probably, I probably was thinking of a lot of things, films and theater. And he might have, because he was so determined, strengthened my resolve to maybe try records because that's what he wanted to do more than anything. So together we really became sort of obsessed with doing a record. And um, I, that's my recollection, we more evolved together, that we both became more and more focused on doing a record. After we did that show at the New York Shakespeare Festival, uh, we did the National Lampoon Show on tour. That had been an amazing show I had seen. John Belushi started there, who was one of Meet's best friends. And um, I became musical director. And uh, we toured with that, and while we were touring, I was writing. And that was a good experience, too, to, to just go around. And that, that had a lot of influence to me in other ways, too. Um, I could see how audiences reacted to Meet Love, not just in the show More Than Deserve, but in this show where he played like 20 different characters and skits. Uh, they would chant his name at the end. Um, and it, it was partly made me realize what a great name it was. <laughs> um, to hear a, a whole college, it was mostly colleges we played, whole college crowd of like 1,500 people who had never seen him before, heard of him, at the end going, me, love, me, love. It was very cool. And also, it was a very blasphemous, irreverent show. I mean, much went much further than Saturday Night Live could ever go. And um, it was exciting to me to see extreme audience reaction, too. I remember a lot of really extraordinary gigs we played. The, my favorite was, we, for whatever reason how they booked it, we played like a bunch of gigs in the Bible Belt of um, Pennsylvania, strangely enough. It wasn't, you think of the Bible Belt as the Deep South, but there's an extraordinarily intense Bible Belt in Pennsylvania. And they booked like four shows in a row at these intensely Christian Bible schools. I don't know why, but it was the one I really remember vividly was, um, they had just won their football game or something. It was a Saturday night. They were, it's typical for a Bible school. They were drunk beyond belief. They were the rowdiest audience I've ever known. And we had an absolutely viciously sacrilegious crucifixion sketch. Uh, sketch in the uh, show and in the middle of it they started chanting the Lord's Prayer in anger like and it was one of the most fascinating things to hear about 900 people mostly it seemed like the jocks of the school violently going our father who art in heaven like and they were throwing bottles and I remember they threw a bottle that knocked the top of the piano down it was raised up with a stick and it hit the stick that holds the top up and the piano almost came crashing down on my fingers and I just walked off I figured... You're laughing inside. But you're crying even deeper inside. You know me too well. <laughs> um, ready? Yes. Um, now, the, the, the struggle to make this record why it took so many years to go from wanting to make the record to actually having this record out. It's probably like a lot of why it takes so many years to go from wanting to to having. <laughs> Could be a lot of things. Um, it was torture. It was, um, you know, we worked, Meatloaf and I worked almost a year alone in a little rehearsal room. And that was my favorite time. I, that's what I wish people could have experienced. It was a little room in a, uh, with a piano, a cubicle basically, not as big as this room. And um, that's how I really remember him. That's the room where you could feel the wall shake. He was amazing in that room. And we'd work really hard. We worked bar by bar on these songs. We treated them like, it was like film or theater rehearsal. It wasn't like the usual music thing. And um, it was an extraordinary time. And you know, we thought it was great. And uh, Meet's lawyer, David Sonnenberg, who became his manager, um, then had the job of trying to get a record company. And um, that was, just horrible. Everyone hated it. It was, um, I mean, my, my recollection, which I think is pretty accurate, was we were rejected by about 30 record companies, at least. And I know we were rejected by about 17 to 20 producers. And I used to say at the time, as David would remember, I'd say, you know, there are people who just have the vague notion of someday starting a record company whose first act is simply to reject us before they even have one. 
It was, uh, and they were vitriolic rejections. They weren't nice, they were really nasty. My favorite rejection, which I really do treasure because I, I love Clive Davis. I think he's truly one of the only great people I've met in the record business. But he, his rejection was so brutal. And uh, he probably doesn't remember it like this, but it meant a lot to me. Because I like brutal rejections. <laughs> Again, I, I like these extremes. Just like I was saying, I like the fact that these, these Bible kids hated the National Lampoon Show. That exhilarated me because I hadn't experienced that much. I hadn't ex experienced what it feels like for an audience to hate something. Because they don't hate something that's bad. They hate something that upsets them. And that makes them nervous. That, that it creates a fault line and there's an earthquake forming and they're going to fall in the crevice. And that's exciting. And that's actually a good thing for art or entertainment to do. And um, that exhilarated me. And I was usually exhilarated, as I remember it, by these rejections. Um, I think Meat was far more depressed. I mean, it wasn't joyful for me. But uh, with, when we did Clive Davis, and he was one of the later ones, where I remember Davis said, this guy's going to love it. He's a real music man. They were always, everyone we got rejected by the next guy, but this guy's a real music man. <coughs> None of them were music men, but Clive kind of was. And um, so we went to Clive's office. Wait, I got to take some water. <laughs> I need the morphine when I think of this. Swig. <coughs> And Clive had just moved into, it was, he was just starting Arista Records. It was a little place in New York that had been Bell Records, that had Barry Manilow, uh, Mandy had been on Bell Records, and he kept them for Arista. So we went in this little room, and uh, we played, and when we did auditions with just piano, we did basically the exact same show we do, like, a few years later for 25,000 people at Madison Square Garden. It was no different, uh, except it was just me and piano and Meatloaf and Ellen Foley but it was all staged. I'd usually end up, it was my secret from when I was in bands in uh, college, to if I, I made my nails, I cut my nails really short so that if I pounded really hard enough, the skin would pull away underneath the nail from the nail and I could hold my hands over the keyboard and bleed at the end. That was my gimmick. <laughs> I was trying to compete with Kiss and all that. And uh, so it ended with me bleeding on the keyboard and you know, we did about 25 minutes. We didn't have all the songs then. But through the whole thing, Clive just sat there at the desk like he was on Prozac, totally bored, and kept looking at his watch, and you could tell he didn't want to be there. And then we finished the audition, and Meat was always like Moby Dick after a workout, just a mass of sweat. And I was sweating and bleeding, and Ellen was simply in shock because she had Meat's tongue down her throat for like five minutes, and that always led to a certain kind of shock. And, um, and so we wait for Clive's evaluation. And Clive, I remember this so well, he, um, he sits there and uh, he's, he's tapping his, you know, impatiently tapping his hand like waiting for a tan. And he goes, oh, is that, is that it? Is, is the audition over? He said, yes. And he goes, all right, I, I do have a dinner in about 10 minutes, so I'm going to have to rush this, but I do have some notes for you. Um, starting with you, Mr. Steinman, do you ever listen to uh, contemporary radio? And the little signal went off, no, this is not going to be a great deal. That's not a good opening. And I said, yeah, I listen all the time to contemporary radio, <laughs> wondering what I was getting into. And Clive said, well, I don't hear that in your music. It doesn't seem like, it seems like you really should, both of you, I think, you listen to me. I, I think, Jim, particularly, you have to go back and listen to radio, what, what pop music's about. I said, okay, what's wrong? <laughs> he said, well, it's just that you don't understand what a pop song is, what we're looking for. And this was really shocking to me because it was so brutally stated. And he goes, um... I can explain it for you if you want. I could even diagram it. Would you like that? I said, yeah. I said, I'm going to get a diagram from Clive Davis. Wow. And then he takes out this yellow, I still have this, a yellow, little yellow pad. And I have a little piece of paper. And he, and he starts writing on it. He says, well, let me tell you what we're looking for in a pop song. It's a very simple structure. You start with the verse, A. And he writes A. Second verse is optional, but let's put it in. He writes A again. So then there's a bridge. He writes B. The bridge is simply a way we go from the verse to the chorus. In the industry, we call it the hook. And he writes C. Then you can have an instrumental. That's optional, too, but let's put it in D, instrumental. He says, but then for the instrumental, you come back to the hook, and you fade in the hook so the audience remembers the hook. C, C, C. And that's it. And he says, now that's what we're looking for. Basically, A, B, C, 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 C. That's the key to a hit record. Now, with your songs, I got lost around W. I said, oh, that's not good either. <laughs> and he says, but you've got to understand the structure. That's why it has to be the symbol. Of, Do you want this piece of paper? And it's something like the Michelangelo tapestry of God handing something down to Moses. This hand hands me this yellow piece of paper. And I was like, 
oh, the gods are giving me, and I still have this paper that has A, A, B, arrow, C, 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 C. And I was getting lost in W, and now I get lost around Z. I go into another alphabet, <laughs> but um, it was brutal. He just didn't hear it at all. And Meatloaf, the whole time, as I remember it, was standing there, and Meat had a great, he always had a great attitude. I, the thing about Meat was he really believed in the music, which was amazing. Uh, he really felt it viscerally. But another part of him, more conscious level, always wondered if I wasn't truly insane. And uh, kind of, I know all the time he was looking into other songwriters. And he was particularly obsessed with this guy, um, I forget his name now, but he wrote Drift Away. Troy Seals, Troy Seals, a song Dobie Gray did in the 70s. Uh, that was much more southern sort of pop rock, um, which is what Mead, I think, thought maybe he should go to, you know, more southern R&B tradition. And um, he was standing there with this look in his face like, that's true, Jimmy's songs go all the way to W. That's no good. Uh, he's got to learn how to write short songs. You know, I'm going to be ruined. i got to get another songwriter. And he had a look in his face that I could tell was sort of, you know, Clive, Clive knows what he's talking about. Jimmy's got to, he's got to straighten up. And then Clive turned to Meatloaf, who I was sure he was going to expect compliments. And Clive goes, um, now I, I do have to rush because it's getting late, but you, Mr. Loaf, let me ask you. He's, yeah, yeah. And he's all ready for the compliment. He goes, um, uh, do you ever listen to contemporary singers? And Meat got this look and he's like, yeah, why? He says, well, you don't seem to. You seem to be more in the tradition of a Broadway singer, like Robert Goulet. And Meek got this look in his face that I really thought he was going to kill Clive Davis. <laughs> he just got this amazingly possessed look, like, Robert Goulet. <laughs> it's like, don't say Robert Goulet. <laughs> and um, it was very tense, I thought. Uh, Clive wasn't aware of it. Clive just went on. And you just, you have to adapt your style so you're not belting in this legit kind of Broadway, because no one likes that anymore. No one's interested in it. Um, so the two of you should go back to the drawing board because there's some talent here, but I just think it's so wrong and so misdirected. If you just listen to pop radio and if you listen to a few pop singers, I think you'll see what they're going for. And that was my lecture from Clive, who then became a great supporter over the years, but it was brutal. In defense of the Clive and the guys who rejected the Beatles, do you, would you discuss the fact that were you two a long shot? That you know, you two walking in a room at that era in music, do you think you two represented? Quite a leap of faith. Well, there's two ways to look at it. I mean, from a record person's point of view, which is of course the stupid way to look at it, uh, it was a ridiculous leap of faith. It was absurd because you got to keep in mind what was going on at the time <coughs> in pop music. It was the era of Saturday Night Fever, so it was disco. It was the dawn of disco. It was also the dawn of punk, really, the Sex Pistols at its prime. So you had pump and, uh, punk, <laughs> pump, punk and disco are the two extremes. And there we are doing these 10 minute Wagnerian rock operas, which made no sense at all uh, to anybody. And um, so from a record company's point of view, I think it made no sense. Now, from my point of view, I'm not even gonna claim the higher ground of you know, art or that. I just thought, and I still think this way, by the way, commercially speaking, I always think <clears throat> you're starting 20,000 steps ahead of the game if you're doing something that no one else is doing. For instance, if I said, I've got the greatest band of lesbian according playing polka fanatics. They do the greatest polkas on according, they're all lesbians. Will you sign this? I'd sign in a second. Because how many lesbian according playing, you can't say that, I should find another term for it. How many polka playing accordion playing lesbian bands are there? And I just figured if there's a market for it, at least you're the only one. And the fact is, this is such a damn huge country this, and world. There's probably a market for that. I'm getting kind of into this idea of the lesbian accordion band. But you, I just think that if you're doing something no one else is doing, you're, you're ahead of the game to start with. And so I'm sitting there thinking, if there's a market for a 350-pound guy singing Wagnerian 10-minute rock and roll epics, we got it covered. I couldn't think of any competition. There were 100,000 skinny blonde guys in satin pants playing guitar solos and screeching and singing what you'd expect, but there was no one doing this. So to me, it was actually stupid thinking. I just think, why not go with the thing that has no competition? And there's probably a market for it. I, I tend to think, if it's in my brain, it's going to be another brain. I do think that way. But that, that's not the way where companies think. What song came the first song was Heaven Can Wait, um, which interestingly enough is a ballad. Um, 
and uh, the last song was Tour de Three Ain't Bad. Other than that, the order is kind of confusing to me because I was working a lot of them at one time. Um, and they would, they would evolve, strangely. Like, Bad of the Hell was finished two-thirds of the way through, and I was the one who was obsessed with writing the part about the crash, the motorcycle crash. And I remember um, fielding really upset phone calls uh, from Meatloaf and Sonnenberg, basically saying, what the hell's going on here? Let's get started. And I'd go, no, the song's really not done. I said, it's uh, seven minutes long. It seems done to us. I said, no, it's got to be a third section. There's, it's supposed to be a crash. I've got to come up with a crash. And I'd go through this with all of them. It's like they kept getting longer, and I kept evolving. And uh, so I'd keep working on like four or five at the same time. Uh, the only exceptions is like, because there are certain big epics on the album, and there are slightly smaller ones. Two out of three ain't bad, Heaven Can Wait, and All Wrapped Up With No Place To Go. Well, the three, I think of them as miniatures, because they're not six minutes or longer. Uh, and they are more just snapshots for me. The others, Bat of the Hell, and For Crying Out Loud, and Paradise by the Dashboard Light, and even you took the words right out of my mouth, which is right in between. It's sort of a single length pop song, but I still thought of it somewhat as epic. Um, they kept evolving, and I kept working on them over a long period. But um, the first one was Heaven Kuwait, and they all started with a title. That's the way I write. They all started with a title or an image, a picture. You mentioned uh, when you talked about working in the, in the uh, I think it was the Antonia Hotel, is that correct? Yeah, Can you we worked there. what the Antonia Hotel was and what the environment because as I understand it, there were all these people working in little, sort of little rooms, is that right? Well, most of the work we did, honestly, was at a place called NOLA, a rehearsal studio. I think we did do some work at the Ansonia Hotel. The cool thing about the Ansonia Hotel, this is where you want to go back cultural history. What an era, Studio 54. And the Ansonia Hotel is particularly resonant for me because it was my first paying job out of school. The first thing I ever got paid for, which made it, except I got paid in advance for the show I did that I was talking about, Dream Engine. Uh, Chapel Music gave me like $20,000. And to me, coming out of school, that was $10 million. I remember sitting there with my friend saying, $20,000? I'm never going to have to work again. This is, well, if I could get it up to 100000 there's never any need to work. Because the interest, you could make 10000 10000 a year, and you don't need any more to live on than 10000 a year. And, and I ended up having this tiny apartment in New York that like at one point 14 people were living at. It was my little commune, because I felt like I was like Donald Trump. I had this $20,000, and um, so that was really the first money I received for anything. But the first money for an actual job, because I didn't consider writing a job, was um, a woman named Elena Reed um, asked me to accompany her. Uh, she did Heaven Kuwait before me did. Um, and she asked me to accompany her, and she said where she was performing to go there. And it was the Sony Hotel, a place called the Continental Baths. And she was opening for this new person named Bette Midler. And I had never heard of Bette Midler. No one had at the time. And uh, this was in the early 70s. And um, I went, I, I was thinking, oh, well, I should get very well dressed. I, I don't know what to wear. Maybe a suit's not right. I'll, I remember changing clothes like four or five times. And I only had three things to wear, so that's a lot of changing. And I ended up going to the Ansonia Hotel. And I was very surprised to walk in and find it's the Continental Baths. <laughs> and there's like 300 guys walking around, either nude or with towels around them. And I'm saying, it's not Kansas anymore, <laughs> it's the old cliche. I was thinking, I wasn't prepared for this. And um, the Ansonia Hotel was just a wild combination of people who lived there, the Continental Baths, uh, show business people who rehearsed there. Um, it was a strange place. It was, it was kind of wondrous, though. Uh, of course, that's what memory does to you. A lot of the things that I remember that might have been seedy in reality were pretty wondrous, um, looking back on it. And because that was a pretty amazing decade, the 70s, actually. I mean, the 60s were the one that really shaped me. But the 70s had all the residue of the 60s. And um, it still was pretty dynamic. Um, that whole double decade, I think, of the 60s and 70s was a cool time. And as much as you can, I have, I have always working in my brain something like the old fogey filter. I always try to filter out me sounding like the old fogey, <laughs> going, ah, you kids today. Uh, I always think of, I always think of myself going, mutter, mutter. I remember when this was all fields. Look at it today. How are you kids, mutter, mutter? <laughs> I always try to stop myself from listening to something on the radio and saying, that really is dog shit. Then I listen again and say, yeah, it really is dog shit. <laughs> it's not the old fogey filter. Um, 
But looking back at that period, it, there hasn't been any equivalent to it. I mean, musically or otherwise, it was an extraordinary time. I mean, I just remember certainly in college in the late 60s, not only the riots going on and protests, and I was being beaten up by cops at demonstrations, but um, when a new Beatles album came out, you'd rush and get it, and like 20 people would sit like in a sacramental situation, like a ritual, in front of these huge speakers in the music building in Amherst College, listening to it like a religious ceremony. And, you know, it's just a little hard to envision people rushing out when the new Nickelback comes out and forming a ritualistic group to hear it. I, it's been a long time since I think music's done that. And it's not say anything except movies like that, too. This golden era. And that was, I think, the era that the 50s when Elvis started and the 60s, late 60s, where I think rock and roll just blossomed wildly. And so you were kind of privileged to experience it. And it could change your life every day <laughs> in a different way. And whether it was the Beatles or Hendrix or Janis Joplin, it was amazing. Or the Doors, which were my personal favorite. Um, you wrote the spoken or written in a book, what was this book called? Ulysses, I believe. Uh, uh, what was the book called? Ulysses, yeah. But he's spoken about uh, his contribution to the songs. I, I think Paris started out short life, maybe being inspired by a girl he had gone out with and told you about. To what extent was Meatloaf influencing or sh helping in any way to shape the song? Uh, the question was just to what extent mm. did he play any role in shaping, as, as we know from the album, songs by Dick Simon, but did anything he was telling you or any of your discussions end up shaping the song? I, you know, I know he tells that story about the girl in high school. I don't remember that, shaping the songs, but I'm sure it's possible. We would talk about so much that it's possible. It was probably symbiotic, a combination. I was probably saying that I want to write the ultimate sex in the car song. He said, you know, Jimmy, I went out with this girl, you know, in high school. And so it was probably a combination of things. Um, you know, I pretty much wrote what I wanted to write, but I, he was a part of my life. And I was writing for him, so I'm sure he had influences that I'm not even consciously aware of. But I'm never aware of sitting down specifically to write something that, you know, he suggested specifically. That's at least how I remember it. But Meade always had a feeling, and it was frustrating for me, he always wanted to feel like he was writing, involved in the writing. I mean, he's done interviews where he actually, I think accidentally says, well, when I wrote that song. And um, in fact, I haven't mentioned when I sang those songs on the, on the CD, um, uh, I think he must have had an influence because uh, he was who I was writing for. And he was a larger than life character and profoundly exciting as a performer. But I don't remember details like that. The, the one I do remember, he always mentions, is that he knew a girl in Paradise by the Dashboard Light. Um, he th that he felt inspired. I don't remember that, but who knows. And early on, in your sort of love-hate relationship with collaborators, then to have any sort of collaborators, uh, what was the percentage of love and hate early on? You know, it's funny. To me, it was never a love and hate thing. I mean, my memory of it with me, love, is it was always very much <clears throat> two guys working together who um, we were never incredibly close but I on a personal level I think I can honestly say with maybe one or two tiny exceptions over 30 years I never even had a huge problem with me though personally the real problems came with problems he had with his voice or with problems with his management lawyers that I stayed away from I just didn't get involved um, I and at that time particularly there weren't really any problems. I mean, my biggest problem then was that, uh, was with David Sonnenberg in that originally it wasn't Meatloaf, it was Meatloaf and Jim Steinman. Uh, we were a duo in the sense, a different kind, but it was, it was for two, th two and a half, three years, we were working as Meatloaf and Jim Steinman, like Hall and Oates. So I was stunned because David was his manager, and when we got to CBS to sign the record deal, I remember it was a big table, like 12 people, and the president, Walter Yetnikov, was at one end, and they sent the contract around to be signed. And it went by me. I wasn't there to sign it. I remember being surprised. I said, hey, wait, I, I didn't get to sign it. I said, well, you're not in it. And that was the first I found out that they had taken my name off. And um, I think Meat probably thinks this had a more profound effect on me than, than it did, but maybe it did have that profound effect. I just remember being really startled and sort of shattered, just because in my mind it was a very cool thing to have this combination of a songwriter, pianist, and a singer. I didn't know of any example of that, and I thought it was really cool. Um, it was the reason all of our auditions were just piano and, 
and him. It was what we intended the whole thing to be, a piano in the center of the stage, and it would be like that. And uh, David's reasoning was that he thought it was easier to sell with the name Milov. I didn't agree with him, but I also mainly was upset that I didn't know about it. So it wasn't about me. And to Milov's great credit, he was wonderfully loyal. He, uh, I actually eavesdropped, without him knowing it, a uh, studio in New Jersey. We were working on Bad of Hell. And he got on the phone to David in tears and pleaded with him to put the credit back to where it was because he didn't feel comfortable with it being only Meatloaf, which is an interesting seed to a bigger story. I still believe, honestly, had it kept the original credit, I suppose this is a little self-serving, but I don't mean it that way, I think Meat would have had a much easier time over the last 30 years. Because one thing Meat will admit to, I'm sure, is he'll constantly say, I never wanted to be a star. I'm not comfortable being a star. And he had a lot of breakdowns and problems, which I think had a lot to do with it was just his name. He felt much more comfortable when it was the two of us because we shared the burden. And he wasn't the person who had to come up with the creative work. He didn't have to write the stuff. I think when he felt his name was there, because you know how the audience is. The audience thinks actors make up their lines. They think the singer, to this day, a lot of people think Meat Loaf wrote the songs. That proved to be a great burden on him, and I think taxed everything. I still, to this day, honestly believe, had it been billed as a duo, Meat would not have had one-tenth of the problems he had psychologically. And I think I would have been happier because I wanted to feel part of it more than behind the scenes. But once it happened, it happened. You know, I remember when I was thinking about it, uh, saying, well, no one's ever going to hear this record anyway. It's not going to matter. Why should I get upset about it? This is such an absurd little project. And um, so I didn't get overly freaked out. I got more probably upset about it later on, a few years later when I, when, like when Meat lost his voice. I was thinking, this is so awkward. This whole thing is clumsy. And, and I really think it was, a terrible act because I think Meat didn't want that burden on him. He didn't want to feel like, and uh, you could see that if you were with him as I was every day when we were touring. Um, the audience would chant for him and love him and it was wonderful and I felt fine. I, it was great because they were loving the songs too, but I could tell it was hard for him because it's almost like he felt he had to come up with songs for the next record and it, suddenly there was the split between us and we weren't like one organism I was someone like the director, and he was the actor, and it was, there was a split, and it was awkward, basically. Uh, so that was the main thing that bothered me. Um, but I don't remember ever feeling anything like love-hate on either end. Well, I loved him as a performer, but, and he was adorable <laughs> at first. I mean, me, when I first knew him, when, he changed a lot in, in a fascinating way. I mean, the character of Meatloaf that he does on stage, and he's, he's very articulate about this. Um, he was always, in a strange way, very articulate before he even knew he was articulate. Um, he, he always played a character. And what the character of Meatloaf, we sort of created that character together. And I directed it, but it came out of him. I could always sense it in him. He was the sweetest person on a personal level, but you could tell there was this beast in there that waiting to get out of the cage. And I thought that was kind of my job, to let the beast out of the cage. Uh, and the stage act was, really staged, which also was very antithetical to what most rock and roll was then. Most rock and roll was all about you be spontaneous, you be yourself on stage. You know, you, when you mentioned the Grateful Dead, that's the perfect example of that. There was no distinction between them and their audience. Rock and roll was essentially communal. The rock and roll I saw was essentially the opposite of communal. It was ritualistic. It was like you were there and there was an altar and you were looking up at something. Uh, I didn't want anything communal. I didn't want anything to do with that rabble out there, so to speak. <laughs> I mean, I, I thought it was a whole different convention. It was more theater. There was an audience and there was performers. Um, and once Meat, we would rehearse the character of Meat Love. I remember specifically, you know, I would direct him how to enter and stalk the stage like a predatory beast. And he did it brilliantly. You know, it would be rehearsed, like the actual movements, the steps, the kind of walk. I mean, if you saw his show the first time we ever performed, that's what he did. The costume we came up with together. And I'm proud of this stuff. You know, this is looked at in rock and roll terms generally as contrivance, not what you do. You know, you, you just go out and even now, you know, I hate to keep picking on bands now, but bands are so n faceless now. And they wear the clothes that it looks like they wear every day. And I hate that. I still think the biggest loss for me is that rock and roll has lost its sense of showmanship. And, with his, and showmanship is really a, a cheaper term for mythology lost sense of mythology. Um, you know, you don't imagine some of the great, you know, I don't imagine Jim Morrison everyday life being like he was on stage. And that's what I loved about all the 60s stuff. And um, 
Meatloaf, once he mastered this character, the walk and stalking the stage, and, and when he entered the first performance we ever did it for the public, he came out and he just stared and glared and stalked for two and a half minutes, maybe. It was one of the greatest things I've ever seen. He didn't make a sound. And he, you know, it was a directed show. He wasn't supposed to even speak during the show. That was one of my favorite things about it. Well, when he did speak, it was scripted. It was very ritualistic. And that, that caused tension. That was hard on him. This is where it again gets to the idea that it was meatloaf was the billing. Uh, it really shouldn't have been Meatloaf or Jim Steinman in a way. It should have been some name for some theatrical experience, you know, like Neverland, you know, come visit Neverland, starring Meatloaf or something. Um, just like Bat of the Hell, to me, the ideal probably wouldn't have been either name. It would have been Bat of the Hell, starring Meatloaf, written by Jim Steinman. I, that's how I saw it. It was more like a movie. Um, but we were on tour. We started touring, and the tour was an amazingly instructive thing. Uh, the first show we ever did was such a disaster. It's one of those classic, legendary things. I remember th in September of 77, we were walking down the street, and the record was just going to come out. And I remember Meat saying to me, uh, you know, Jimmy, we've got to take this gig. Sonnenberg said it's really important. It's uh, Chicago. We'll be opening for Cheap Trick. It's a great thing. CBS wants us to do it. We've got to do it. I said, well, I don't know. We haven't really gotten the stage show down right, and it's premature. And I don't think we should. He said, oh, you gotta, you got to stop being this visionary all the time. you got to just be practical. What could go wrong? This is like in a movie where you do a jump cut. What could go wrong to an audience viciously throwing everything they could find at us? Fruit, vegetables, you know, you name it. We were just a disaster. It was a hometown crowd that, in Chicago that came to see Cheap Trick. It was like their homecoming. And they didn't even have us on the bill. They didn't announce us. And so they're all there to see Cheap Trick. And before Cheap Trick came out, I walk out first, all in black leather, and I do this sort of strip tease of gloves, taking rituals, and I was booed mercilessly. Boy, they hated me. I must have been pretty cool. Um, but they really hated me. And, and I'm sure Meatloaf's in the wings, just like with Clyde Davis saying, boy, they really hate Jimmy. At least I'll be out there and it'll save the show. Meatloaf came out and boy, did they hate him. <laughs> they just, they were vicious. They were yelling out, fat boy, you know, eat a salad. <laughs> it was like the worst things they could say. And uh, mostly about how, you know, he's fat. You know, it was really insulting stuff. And shut up and stop singing. And I remember Meat was adorable. I'm, I'm at the piano and Meat comes up to me, you know, while they're saying these things. And he goes, Jimmy, what do I say? They just said you're a fat pig. <laughs> and I said, uh, tell them that their mother wears army boots. <laughs> and he <laughs> actually, I had no idea what to say. I was playing the piano. And he goes, OK, I'll do that. <laughs> he goes, your mother wears army boots. I said, shut up, you stupid fat hippo. He goes, Jimmy, that didn't work. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not too good at these ad-libs then. <laughs> Let me play the piano. And they just booed us off the stage. It was a total disaster. And I remember afterward, everyone was sitting around like it was a morgue. Um, we had two guitarists, two brothers, the Kulik brothers, one of whom was in Kiss now, uh, Bob Kulik. And uh, they always kept saying they were great in that they were like the old grizzled veterans because they had toured with some band. They'd always say, it's a jungle out there. It's a jungle. You guys don't know what a jungle it is. And I'd always say, ah, who cares? And then they're out there after the show, they're out there going, we told you, it's a jungle. It's a jungle. We're dead. And Sonnenberg's going, we've got to rethink this whole thing. We've got to go back. Maybe it should be just piano. We should play maybe lounges or something. We can't do this. And I was the only one, Meat remembers this, I think. I was the only one who was sort of saying, this was cool. Did you, they really hated this. I mean, this really, it was that same, I always had that reaction. Um, I wasn't totally detached from reality, but 90%. I just thought it was really cool that they hated it so much. And um, it was a complete flop. Uh, they just were not interested. And it also showed how you can't just introduce an audience to something. That was something I knew from theater. You had to prepare an audience. And um, so we were going to do no more shows like that. That's what we said. We had to headline, even though it was a new act. Because that was the usual thing. You know, you opened for a bigger act. We wouldn't do that. And the main change was we decided, even if it's the tiniest clubs, we'll have to headline and do the, all the show we can do. And the next time we played was a place in New Jersey called Creations, a little nightclub. You know, about 300 people. And I remember Meat was so terrified to go on because he hadn't been on stage since Chicago. And he was shaken like crazy, going, I can't go out there. They're going to call me fat. I can't go out there. And everyone had to hold his hand. We had to drive around with him before the show. And he went out there, and they had just started playing the record on WNEWFM. Only two stations in America were playing the record, uh, MMS in Cleveland and NEWFM in New York. Uh, the record took forever to get started. Um, radio people hated it, like everyone else, and, uh, except for these two stations. And NEW was our salvation in New York, because I could hear it. It meant it existed. And there's a guy who's a legendary figure named Scott Muni, who's <clears throat> probably one of the first two or three 
freeform, they were called, in DJs. What everyone takes for granted now, FM radio, didn't exist then. There were only a few stations, FM radio. And he was a pioneer in playing the new rock and roll and not just playing top 40. And Scott, Scott Muni also, by the way, had one of the best uh, observations about Bat of the Hell ever when I met him years later. I said, Scott, how you doing? He goes, oh, you know that Bat of the Hell? I love that record. You know why I always played that record? I thought he was going to say because it was brilliant. I said, no, why'd you always play that? Because those songs, they were so fucking long. I could put one on, go take a dump, read the paper, still have two or three minutes to come back, wipe myself, and I was ready to go again. And I thought that was... I really treasured that. I thought that was, that was the most practical of, uh, comment I ever got from radio. And uh, they were playing the record, and we got to this place, Creations, there's three other people or so. <coughs> and um, me and Luff walked out on stage, and from the beginning of the show to the end, they sang along with every song. They knew every lyric, and they cheered everything, and you could see him physically change during the show. Uh, it was like you felt every tendon becoming inflamed, every muscle becoming resurrected, every nerve tingling and the brain expanding and he just stood there and he went from being like, you know, um, Archie Bunker's wife, Gene Stapleton, <laughs> this sad sort of, you know, scared figure to this heroic sort of Marvel Comics superhero like that and you could just watch it happen during one show and he remained that, you know, he became sort of a superhero. Once he knew that the audience was... Oh no, Todd. I look like the same person. I have not yet changed. So where were we? I'm going to ask you, so oh. when he was, uh, once you knew the audience was with, was with him, he became a superhero. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. Awesome. That's the thing. Are we, are we ready? Uh, so, Tim, you were saying, what happened when the audience, once you knew the audience? Well, yeah, the once audience, he felt the pulse of the audience and felt the audience was with him organically, it's like Batman knowing Gotham City was behind him. He could soar ten times as high. And he really became much more the Meatloaf character, which I'm sure screwed him up in his private life. Because the Meatloaf character was such an extraordinarily complex character. Now, you got to keep in mind that to my memory, when I first met Meatloaf, he was the sweetest farm kid. He was a kid from Texas. He did seem, in that sense, and I'm sure it's my shallow perception because I didn't know him well, he seemed almost one-dimensional. Uh, as I got to know him, I knew there was a lot more going on in the service. He had a really difficult childhood, a really difficult life with his family, ran away from home at the age of 14, I think. Um, so there's a lot more going on, but it didn't show. But that's why maybe I sensed it intuitively, and he sensed it as a performer could bring it out. This other monster could come out of the cage and be so powerful and bestial and, and predatory, but, and also funny at the same time. And it had to be this essential sweetness or it wouldn't have worked. He would have just seemed obnoxious. Or a contrivance, like an Alice Cooper, but he did it. Uh, it was real. That's why he didn't need makeup and stuff, uh, like an Alice Cooper or a Kiss. But he was just as much an extreme comic book figure in the best sense as Alice Cooper or a Kiss. And um, so this show at Creations was a turning point, because he felt he could have the audience with him, as he always had that faith, but he had lost it from the bad show in Chicago. And what that, the problem then became because it was billed as meatloaf, I think he felt more of, a, more of an onus to be what he thought a performer should be. And I remember early on in the tour, very early on, just probably the second month, uh, we were playing Pittsburgh, in a place in Pittsburgh. And um, it was the first time he veered away from the script, so to speak. And again, this is tricky, because he's thinking of himself as a performer, and what does a performer do but come out and ad-lib and talk to the audience? That was never done in our show. The way our show had been constructed, it was really scripted. There's very little talking at all, and what there was was scripted or ritualistic, like the speech on um, Hot Summer Night. You know, on a hot summer night, would you offer your throat to the wolf with the red roses, that sort of thing. Because uh, I didn't want him talking, to be honest. Uh, it wasn't as interesting, and it wasn't as mysterious. But I think he felt weird not talking. And in Pittsburgh, it, for whatever reason, it came out, and he walked out on stage, and he looked at the audience, and instead of just stalking and glaring, he turned to him and said, how you mothers doing tonight? You ready to party? You ready to party hard? Pittsburgh, you ready to party? You know, and he became, to me, every other rock and roll band in the country. 
thing, you're ready to party. You know, hey, Minneapolis! And I was just withering up. I was horrified, actually. And Sonnenberg was in the audience, and he was horrified, too. And we had a big confrontation afterward with Meatloaf in the, the hotel room. And uh, I remember it was really violent. He was really upset. Because to him, it was like questioning the validity of him as a person. Like, I can't talk to my own audience? Because it had become his audience, because it was his name, which is understandable. But to us, it was a scripted piece, a theater piece. And that's where the real conflict started. It was a problem for him. And he got so upset at the idea that he couldn't say that. And to us, it was simply artistic. It wasn't interesting, him saying, you ready to party tonight? It just didn't fit this great Marvel Comics character. You know, it's like Batman saying, hey, Gotham City, you ready to party? Hey, Robin, come on, let's boogie. It's, it didn't fit that world. It wasn't mythic at that point, and it wasn't extreme. And he went berserk in this, hotel is not the right word, motel room. He threw uh, a chair through the window, I think. He broke stuff, mirrors. And then he stalked out of the room. And uh, I remember we had to go find him. My memory of this is probably a little more colorful than it was, but it still doesn't matter. At a certain point where truth is not nearly as accurate as what you can embellish memory with. And it probably, as I remember it, it is much more representative of the real truth of the whole experience. Is we had to go looking for him because he had tried to take his life a few times. Never succeeded. I don't think they were meant to be successful. And one of them was when we were making the record, which has to do with Todd, which I can go into later, Todd Rundgren. <clears throat> but this time, David was justifiably concerned. He said, uh-oh, come on, we've got to get a search party. He's out there. He, he could do damage to himself. He's really upset. Because it's like in his mind, we know he's going, I don't exist, huh? I can't say hi. I'm not worthwhile, huh? You know, it's like that kind of thing. It's like an, it's like an actor who, doesn't feel, who feels he should improvise, basically. It's a strange idea, because I would talk to him all the time and say, me, so I'm Francis Coppola and you're Marlon Brando of The Godfather. Who's cooler? It's cooler to be Marlon Brando, right? But it was difficult for him with the name Meatloaf out there. And uh, so we went out looking for him. And I remember this like Night of the Living Dead, partly because it was Pittsburgh. And Night of the Living Dead was filmed in Pittsburgh. That was a big movie at the time. And I didn't realize till I had been in Pittsburgh that it was pretty much a documentary, Night of the Living Dead. So I, my, I was entranced by Pittsburgh because it was where Night of the Living Dead was filmed. I was amazed that Not of the Living Dead turned out to be so much a documentary about Pittsburgh, because the people looked like that uh, at the time. That's how it seemed to me. And we were in this real, the worst area of Pittsburgh, like a horrible, I wouldn't even describe it as a ghetto. It was more like a toxic chemical experimentation laboratory. All you saw around you were these horribly colored toxic fumes coming out of, I guess, factories or steel mills. Blue, purple, green, it was scary. It was like, you know, one of the, pure science fiction. Like, you expected mutants to emerge around in every, every corner. And we're in this huge parking lot next to this motel, which was totally deserted. A deserted parking lot, fumes everywhere. And we're like a search party in the Frankenstein movie. Like, we all had flashlights, but they could have been torches. And there's like eight of us, and we're going around going, meat, meat, meat. And <laughs> what I remember as a, a nice touch was this station wagon pulls up with this little old couple that looked like a... The Grant Wood painting of America, like one should have a pitch for, like the old grandma and grandpa from a commercial for Kellogg's Corn Flakes or Metamucil or something. They pull up and they were probably looking for directions. They drive up very, you know, nicely and they pull up to this group and they suddenly see eight people with flashlights going, meet, 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 and they go, never mind. <laughs> they speed out of there, having come upon this rare group of cannibals from Pittsburgh. <coughs> and um, we're looking for meatloaf and they, we looked everywhere. And I finally got a sense that it wasn't going to be in this area, and I went all the way to the other area of the parking lot. It's like probably the length of a football field. And I see this figure crunched down in a hunched position, like, a, like basically um, a running back in football. Uh, Meat was a football player, and boy, he was powerful. And he was like in his you know, set position, down like, like, like a rhino or an elephant, something about to charge. And you could always see, one thing you could always recognize Meat by on stage, too, one of the most amazing things on stage is, and it doesn't show up on film well, but the steam that would come out of his body was like the steam that comes out of a manhole in New York from the subway system, if you're on stage, because of the amount of heat that he generates, there'd be a massive amount of steam coming out of his body. You'd think that he had like 500 you know, Haitian workers inside his stomach, all illegally making clothes for Kathy Lee Gifford. <laughs> it was just an amazing amount of steam. 
And you can see that in this parking lot. That's how I noticed them. There's this huge volcanic eruption of steam. And I went toward it, all the other side. And there he is, crouched down. I can't do this, I'm sitting down. But he's crouched down in this position. And I said, meet? He goes, <sighs> I said, and I figured, okay, we're having a conversation. That's good. I said, are you okay, meet? He says, I'm, I mean, I, I mean, I'm a Frankenstein monster. I'm me. I'm me, love. I'm not your Frankenstein monster. I said, no, I know me. Now I'm Francis Coppola. I said, uh, and meanwhile, way on the other side of the parking lot, where there's a truck stop, which is also right out of none of them been dead, there's this huge truck. I don't even know what the right term is, but the, one of those enormous trucks that you get a small country into. And it had that amazing front that someone spent a lot of time on where they did a customized front with the special fenders, and it had a devil's head huge devil's head on the front, and the fenders had been made, I say, hope I'm using the right term, but the things, basically, you know, the breasts, the huge nipples that stick out, they were turned into these amazingly sharp fangs. So there are two fangs on either side, a devil's head, this is the perfect truck. And the guy had gone in to get, you know, hostess Twinkies, or whatever these satanic truck drivers eat, and so it was empty, the truck. He's not in the truck, and it's just out there idling, and meat is aimed directly at those fenders. I can see, he goes, I'm not a Frankenstein monster. <laughs> and, I, and I realized, well, I shouldn't interfere with this. Something's coming. And I just moved aside, and he charged, like, <laughs> excuse me, lost an eyeball. And um, like, it seemed like 100 miles an hour. He charged in his crouched position, like a football player. It would make Marcus Allen envious. And went full force, had to go at least 100 yards gathering up speed. He's a fast, strong guy. Uh, and rammed headfirst into that truck, into the sharp, piercing fender. And I remember the forehead exploding, blood pouring out like firecrackers. And all I remember thinking was, God, look at the way the red of the blood mixes with the fumes of green and purple and the devil's head. And You know, it was like a wonderful image to me. Uh, I had obviously lost touch with reality, too. And he just crashed, and the truck was far more damaged than me. He just had to get, you know, stitches or something, which is not so unusual for him. Um, but that was our confrontation about, uh, you know, the scripted show. And as I remember, he went back to the scripted show for a while, but then gradually had to make it more of his way to talk to the audience and kind of found a balance. But that was kind of metaphorically, I think, what he went through a lot for the next 20 years, whether he was Meatloaf, the character, for which he didn't have someone to write material because he wasn't that person, or was he Meatloaf the person who would never be so predatory and monstrous on stage? And I think it became difficult. It's the old story of, um, what's that old movie, A Double Life or something, where someone's playing the part of Othello and they start becoming the part and end up killing their own wife. It's like the, the blur between reality and the part he was playing. And much more so in this, because it wasn't a movie. It wasn't like it was Othello, it was Meatloaf. It was his name. His real name, strange enough, being Meatloaf, was also the name of the Marvel Comics superhero, rock and roll, icon, mythic character he was playing. It had to be confusing, you know. Jim Steinman wasn't confusing. That was just what I was. But it was definitely confusing for him, I think. Um, but it was exciting to see all these shows. and. Uh, and it was also an interesting lesson what you could do. I mean, it showed that it was still an uphill battle, even with the artists, to do rock and roll as theater. That um, it was an interesting thing to witness. Uh, so the material you wrote for him required incredible commitment from him. He's a performer who had a flair for committing. But when he was on stage, and apparently, tell me if it's true, was there oxygen on the side of the stage? And he's a guy who obviously is a little heavy. Uh, you know, yeah, there was a... Do you, do you ever have a sense of guilt and concern that this guy was going to implode or kill himself on stage? None whatsoever. I, um, I probably, if I had thought that, would have wondered if I had the song ready to be his, you know, expiration song. Um, no, it was... It's just something I accepted about him. He gave more than any performer I ever know. Uh, he, you know, he, he was the embodiment of the cliche. He gave 150%, which he did. Um, it's the only way he knew how to perform. It's what got him into trouble. It's why he lost his voice. Uh, he had an operatic voice. You can't use an operatic voice six times a week. And that first year, unfortunately, the tour was booked like six nights a week sometimes. Um, Sonnenberg, his manager, was in this difficult position of trying to break a record by the rules, certain rules he had to play, but didn't fit him. 
I mean, I thought he shouldn't have been doing more than three a week, but there was no way to do that. And so um, he just wrecked his voice really quickly, and they didn't give him time to recover. I remember he wanted time to recover. He would plead for it, but he wasn't given it. He just get back out there. Um, and the oxygen was on stage. There was this tent where he would go for oxygen, and, and he would always faint after the show. I don't even know how much of this he could control or not. Some of it might have been the character, but the character was real, so there's really no distinction. Um, the horrifying part of him at the end, fainting was, for me, <laughs> I would come off a mass of sweat too, and he'd be usually on the floor completely naked. This is quite a sight, to see Meatloaf on the floor completely naked. And um, his general act, I try to avoid it, but generally what he'd do is he'd reach up, and it's a sweet thing, but for me it was terrifying. He'd go, Jimmy, Jimmy, I did it again! And he'd grab me and pull me down on him. And suddenly I'm in this porno movie with this sperm whale. And I'm terrified. <laughs> I'm lying there, you know, doing a lot of things with Moby Dick again. <laughs> and I'm wondering when the spout's going to go off and what's going to come out. And um, he's going, Jimmy, Jimmy. And, you know, it was, it was a sweet gesture, you know. But to him, it was, this, it was a huge athletic ordeal and a huge, it was like basic training every show for a Marine. He, um, he wanted it to be that. And that was part of the thrill of it. He was, he was, he was always on the edge himself of basically expiring, you know, so to speak. Um, I mean, there are probably ways he could have done it without getting in so much trouble if he wanted to spend more time on technique, exercise, such. But it would have been the same meatloaf. It would have been the same thrilling sense of danger. And he was really like the character in Bad Out of Hell. He was always that, that close to immolation, you know. Just, you did think, especially if you saw the steam coming out of his body, you expected he could spontaneously combust, like at any point. He seemed like that kind of performer. Again, that spoiled me in that, uh, not to be the old fogey again, but you know, when I see bands today, there's very few I can see spontaneously combusting. I mean, again, there are very few you can see even coming close to a boil if you leave them on a hot fire for 40 hours. They stand up there in their stupid clothes and they groan on and on. And this is unfortunately what VH1 has to deal with. I know that from speaking to them. They say, what do we do with these bands? You know, it's not like they're overflowing with personality and uh, showmanship, not to mention the other extreme, which is mythology, which is above that. So um, that was the thrilling thing about Meatloaf. And that, I think, was the thing that offended the other camp, so to speak, which, strangely enough to me, personally, was a lot of the people who were associated with Springsteen, uh, who was one of the greatest showmen of all time. But the people around him were pathetic sycophants. They still are. Dave Marsh, I think he's still alive. He was pathetic. Oh, I wanted to bring down for you to read Lester Bangs, a great review by Lester Bangs, the great rock critic. Uh, it was only sent to me two weeks ago. I'd never read it in 1978. Great piece, just raving about Bad of Hell is one of the great albums of all the time and destroying darkness on the edge of town. And it was, it was really a great, like everything you wrote, really wonderfully bracing, anarchistic kind of rebellious piece. But um, a lot of these people around Springsteen were like, you know, hated the show because it was so much, you know, Bruce on stage was exciting because it was Bruce. This was me being a character in a created world, and that somehow seemed to them a violation of something about rock and roll, which I thought was really stupid. But um, it certainly was the only act I could think of at the time doing that, except for things like Kiss and uh, Alice Cooper, which were a little different, much more stylized comic book. Though I loved them. I remember seeing Kiss, uh, their first show ever at the Mercer Arts Center in New York, in a little room, Kiss in a tiny room. And I was a huge fan of theirs forever. I, I bought my apartment from Gene Simmons, their bass player. And I remember, you know, his attitude to the group wasn't, he didn't seem to show mo much respect for the group musically. It was more a business proposition. He's a brilliant businessman. I was the one who was saying, no, don't underestimate it. You guys are dealing with mythology. It's brilliant. I thought Kiss was brilliant in that sense. And Alice Cooper was too. I mean, to me, those were all huge steps forward. Um, even to this day, you know. I don't care what the music's like, I'll always love Insane Clown Posse, I'll always love Slipknot. It wouldn't matter if they were doing only Barry Manilow songs. I consider them brilliant because I wish there were more groups like that. i getting so tired, I was tired in the 60s of it, of people walking out on stage like they are in real life. I just, coming from a theater background, when you walk out on the stage, you have an obligation almost to leave your real life behind and to assume another identity, visually, emotionally, viscerally. and. Um, and me did that, I think it screwed him up a lot. But um, wherever I started with this thought. <laughs> Let's jump to, uh, tell me how important a role in this story, in this epic story, how important is Todd Rundgren's part in, in Bad Out of Hell? 
Well, I think Todd Rundgren is, well, first of all, I think he's a genius, and I don't use that word a lot. I don't think I've ever used it about more than two or three people in pop music. He's certainly the only genius I've ever worked with. Um, he's awesome. He, he actually takes my breath away, Todd. He, um, I wish people knew how brilliant he really is, even though his albums are staggering. They're not even the tip of the iceberg. He, um, he was so instrumental in this being done. For one thing, he's the only producer who would do it. <laughs> so just on that basis alone, he was very valuable. Every other producer rejected it. Forgetting the record companies, we went to every producer and got comments like, it's ridiculous, you can't do this on a record. Uh, you can do this on stage, maybe, but you can't do it on a record. You know, because they'd see something like Paradise by the Dash for Light, which was like 20 minutes when we did it, with all the acted stuff, you know, Meatloaf making out with Ellen Foley, Phil Rizzuto's speech, which at the time I would do live, you know, going around the bases like in baseball. And they just think, this is crazy, it can't be a record. And I would think, I don't see why not. I, I, I couldn't understand it. To me, it was, it was like the soundtrack of a movie. You just do it like that. Um, Todd was the only one, I swear to God, the only one. Strange enough, the producer we wanted was a guy named Bob Ezrin, who had done Lou Reed, but we couldn't get his phone number. And, um, so, and all the others hated it. P Todd listened to us audition at the piano, and he said, okay, I don't see the problem, let's go. He was that casual about it, he always was. That's the great thing about Ke Todd. Nothing surprises him, he's too smart. And um, to this day, I, one of my favorite things about Todd is I don't think he's ever said a complimentary thing to me about the music, but I, I love that. I don't, you know, it's trivial, it'd be petty. Todd's basic attitude is, I think, you know, well, it's a load of inflated junk, but at least it's funny, and I'll do it, why not? <laughs> and so he did it. And um, his genius in it, I mean, I arranged it with him, but his real genius was, I didn't know a thing about record production. So I learned anything I knew from Todd. And um, he knew how to put it together. Uh, he was, I wanted to use Bruce Springsteen's band a lot. I ended up using the drummer, Max Weinberg, and Roy Bitton, the pianist, who are amazing. I still think best drummer and the best pianist I've ever worked with. They're geniuses, but um, <laughs> here I am using genius again, but they deserve it. Um, Todd fought that because he wanted to use his own band, Utopia, but it ended up being a combination on the album. And uh, he just brought all the pieces together and he did all the background vocals. And let me tell you, watching Todd Rundgren create background vocals has got to be one of the most thrilling experiences you can ever have in music. I can't even describe it. It's, it's, it's as exciting as if you got to watch, I know this sounds hyperbolic, but as if you got to watch Mozart compose or John Lennon compose alone and could be in their head because you can actually see it visually and hear it being created. He makes it up on the spot. And his background vocal, I always wanted tons of background vocals. I'm a huge fan of background vocals. And I didn't know at the time how brilliant he was at it. And he'd have three people, be just three people uh, around a microphone, him and Chasm Sultan from his band, his bass player, and Rory Dodd, who was a singer with us. And he'd hand out the parts, and they were astonishing. You know, he didn't do pads like a lot of background vocals or ahs or oohs. He did complex melodies that intertwined counterpoints. And he'd hand them out, and everyone was terrified to admit they couldn't, they didn't have a clue what to do. He would just, and I think he did it partly for perverse fun. He'd go, all right, now this is what you sing. Ah, 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 you. Then you go to the diminished, then you come up here, you do an augmented, then I want you to, he'd go on for like two minutes, and say, that's your part, now remember that. Now you do it, and they go, what, what? <laughs> and they'd never remember it, but, it was astonishing to watch him do that. And he helped tighten everything up. He just, he was brilliant. I mean, really, if that, it was fair, that record should be Bad Out of Hell, written by Jim Steinman, starring Meatloaf, uh, produced by Todd Rundgren. Uh, he, um, he, he was a genius. He, he really, partly because he didn't question it. You know, he didn't overthink it, like this isn't what happened, this is not what's happening, how do we make this more palatable? He just did it. He accepted the music for what it was, and he did it. I, th I think to this day he probably thinks half the ideas that I made him do in the record are ridiculous and all that, but it didn't matter. I didn't want someone sucking up. I wanted someone great, and he was just awesome. Can't say enough about Todd. Describe the sessions specifically where you were, what the atmosphere was like. Well, the sessions were in Woodstock, New York, in Bearsville Studios, which was Todd's studios. Some of them were there. Some of them were at his home studio. They were, really, they were really hard for Meatloaf. They were really bad for Meatloaf, the sessions. Because Todd, they weren't easy for me either. Um, 
But I spent a lot of time with Roy Bitten, the pianist, and a lot of time with Todd, working on the arrangements and the music, which Meatloaf really wasn't involved in. And that was really, looking back in a sense, very unfair to me, but it was the only way to get the record done. And Meat, is, keep in mind, he had spent two years with me, you know, rehearsing, working, um, and all of a sudden, he was sort of left out of it. And a lot of that was Todd. Todd's very acerbic and tough. And Meatloaf would a lot of time be in a corner while we were recording, and he didn't know what to say. Um, it was intimidating to me, too. I was just soaking it in, learning from Todd. And I remember once Meatloaf finally, you could see, got up the nerve to leave the corner and come up to Todd. And I remember Todd going, yes, what do you want? Like someone had come in from outside. And Meatloaf said, well, I, I was just thinking, like, you know, this part here, you could do it like Motown, you know, R&B. Yes, we could. That would be wrong, though, if we did. So why don't you go back to the corner and let us make your record? And he didn't take it well. I mean, he didn't say anything, but that was one of the nights he tried to kill himself. Um, and it was weird. I don't think he really was going to kill himself, but um, the way I remember it is very detailed because um, we hung around. He left, but he said he'd meet us later to go to a movie. And I remember the movie was The Outlaw Josie Wales with Clint Eastwood. <laughs> That's the details I remember. And uh, we left him detailed instructions on a pad of paper how to meet us at the theater because he wasn't around when we were there at the house. And he didn't show up at the theater. As it turned out, he didn't follow the instructions right. He made some wrong turn, and he thought we were tricking him. He, it was total paranoia. He thought Todd didn't want him involved. I didn't want him involved. He's being treated like, you know, completely unnecessary, you know, irrelevant. And, all, and plus, we tricked him not to come to the movies with us, to Miss Clint Eastwood. <laughs> so we come back to the house. We're staying in the house in Bearsville the whole time, which is a wild story, too. He was, he was living with Ellen Foley at the time. Um, who's this tiny waif of a girl? Ellen's like, and whenever I would describe it to people, I say, yeah, you know, meets living with Ellen. They'd always, there'd be this, almost inevitably, this 30 seconds where they go, and I'd say, what is it? I'm just trying to picture it physically. How does that work? <laughs> and I'm saying, it really doesn't involve a crane or anything like that. <laughs> the, phys the body is able to take a lot more than you think. <laughs> and meanwhile, I'm thinking, maybe a crane is involved. I don't know. But um, he was living with Ellen. And I was in the room across the hall from them. It was really a very sweet time living all together. And um, they also, Meat believed in ghosts, and he was convinced that the room was haunted by a ghost. I remember very sweetly um, him telling me about that constantly. And one night there's a knock on my door around 3 a.m. Jimmy, Jimmy, he's here. You gotta come in. Because I convinced Meat I could talk to ghosts. I don't know why, <laughs> but it's one of those things I just said. And so I came in the room, and he's there with Ellen in bed, and Ellen says, he's terrified. He says, it's a, the ghost is here. He's a bad ghost. You've got to do something. I said, okay, well, I'll just sit and talk to him. So I sat down like a nanny on the chair next to them in bed, and I talked to the ghost. And um, I said, oh, the ghost is not a bad ghost. Maybe it's a musician, a musician from the 50s. It's a bass player who really loves your songs. It's just wishes he could be in the record. He's a nice ghost? Oh, yeah? Well, say hi. Said, Ellen, he's a nice ghost. Said, that's good, that's good. Yeah, he's a nice ghost. Okay. Jimmy T and, and I kept talking to the ghost, and then you hear, <laughs> you look over, and there's me to sleep, and then I tiptoe out. It was a very sweet domestic scene in the middle of all this anarchy. Um, but that night we came home, and uh, the door is opened by um, Rory, who's the singer, and Rory's in complete hysterics and going, Oh, God, I don't know where you've been. You know, there were no cell phones or anything. He goes, I, I haven't been able to reach you. Me, me try to kill himself. He, I don't know what to do. What are we going to do? He's trying to kill himself. I said, oh, calm down, calm down, you know. Let's go see what happened. You know, I'm trying to act like I'm in charge. I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. And um, I was taking this pain medication because of the broken bones in my nose, uh, Darvon, which I really needed because I, I was in pain all the time. And uh, I go upstairs, and uh, Rory takes us into the shower, and there's meat nude in the shower, like curled up in the corner, almost fetal, and with the water dripping down on him. And Rory says he hasn't uttered a word in like three hours. He took an overdose of pills. And I'm going, me, what, what's going on? Uh, uh, uh. And I finally talked to him enough, and he goes, Jimmy, I want to die, I want to die, I want to die. I said, well, that's not a good idea, I mean, you can't die. I mean, if you die, what's going to happen? I'll have to get another singer. I guess I could do that. There's some other, yeah, I could do that. I'd have to change the keys. Rory, could we change the keys? Whoa, what, what, what? This is my 
acting in my reverse psychology. The first time I was a paramedic, so I was sort of not sure what to do. That was my strategy. And then uh, the only f screw up in the whole thing was um, I said to Rory, what pills did he take? He said, you took your Darvon. I said, you took my Darvon? Me, you animal. You stupid animal. I need that stuff. I was so furious he took my Darvon. But um, we had to get him to the hospital, and it was a riot because Rory really couldn't drive. He was Canadian. Didn't have a license, I don't think. But he got in the car, and we're driving terribly to the hospital. I didn't have a license. And meets in the back seat, covered in a blanket, completely out of it. And um, I, I, it worked, my strategy, though. I convinced him. I had this bizarre thing where I got into great detail. I said, you know what Darvon does, me? Now I know you took Darvon. It's not going to kill you. All it does is it, it paralyzes the mucous membranes, which means your vocal cords are going to dry up, which means you won't even be able to talk. You'll have to wear one of those little amplification things in your throat. He says, huh? Uh, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to. No. I said, well, then we'll have to get you to the hospital. He goes, no, no hospital. And he had these amazing flashbacks, like war flashbacks, because when he was a kid, he was hit by a, um, uh, what do you call it? Not javelin. Um, no, what's the damn huge ball that they throw? Shot put. Yeah, shot put. It's getting my mind. He was hit by a shot put, like, real close range, which is really dangerous. And he had a skull fracture. He had a total psychotic fear of his brain being tampered with and people go, doctors going near his head. And um, so he really, when you mention a hospital, he freaked. And he go, no, 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 I'm not going. But when I convinced him that he had to go there and he's gonna never talk again, he decided he'd go to the hospital. But we get him to the hospital and these idiot doctors wouldn't come out to the car. They couldn't get him from the car to the hospital. He said, no, we're not allowed to, you have to bring him here. And we finally got one who was off duty to come help us. And we got him in the hospital and I had to fill out the forms like the daddy. I filled out all the forms while he was in the other room. I remember it was really sad, it was really poignant. And, uh, and then the doctor came to talk to me, like I was the parent. And the doctor said, okay, it's, it's going to be all right. You know, we had to pump his stomach. We got everything out. It wasn't uh, going to be fatal. But it, it's good that we pumped his stomach. And uh, mainly he's feeling nauseous and sick. That'll last for about a day. And he's feeling, psychological is the biggest problem. He's feeling a great deal of shame and embarrassment. And I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking, well, what do I do? <laughs> you know? um, it was, it was you know, one of the first times I had seen how fragile he also was. He's an amazing mixture of a colossus and a really delicate, fragile flower. I mean, a strange combination. But I guess that's not so strange since a flower could grow up through concrete, can it? Uh, he's, he was both. And um, Todd didn't include him much at all, if any. Uh, Todd was brutally efficient at making the record, you know. Uh, but he was brilliant. He was inspired. The only thing Todd didn't do was mix it. Todd um, mixed the whole record in one day. I didn't know about mixing at that time. Uh, I've come to realize it's the key to making a record in many ways, and it takes a long time sometimes. And uh, the mixes, Todd did the whole album from 4 p.m. to 4 a.m., and it was one of the wildest things I've ever seen. We ended up remixing, it took about two months at least. And, he, and the amazing thing is two of his mixes are on there, Heaven Can Wait and Hot Summer Night. You took the words right out of my mouth. And that was the first song he mixed. You took the words right out of my mouth. He mixed it at his home studio at a great little home studio behind his uh, house in Woodstock. And uh, all the EQ stuff was on top. It's usually uh, it's a console. You, this is all on top, so he'd lean up to work it. And I remember he said to me, OK, let's mix the first song. What do you want here? You want Phil Spector? I, yeah, I said, that's what you want, Phil Spector, the usual. OK, well, let's try this, this, this. OK, let's see what happens. Then he played the whole song. He didn't touch a thing. The whole song just played from beginning to end, and that's the mix that's on the record. We tried four or five times to see if we could top it. Couldn't even come close. And I thought, this guy's a genius. It sounds perfect. Then the next four songs he mixed, I thought it sounded terrible. <laughs> Except for Heaven Kuwait. He took a nap at around 1 a.m. for an hour and a half, which is amazing because we only worked that 12 hours. And when he woke up from the nap, he says, OK, let's finish. I'll do a ballad first. And he did the mix of Heaven Kuwait, which is also on the record. It was gorgeous. Um, but when it came to the longer songs, he had a short attention span. And um, he got tired of them, and they weren't good mixes, so we had to go and remix the whole album. And um, that's when I really learned a lot about, you know, producing a record, how much was in the mix. Um, but we simply did what I think Todd would have done had he spent the time. Um, it was just like when he took the record to be mastered. I remember he just handed it, it was like a drive through master place, like Burger King. He, it was a place called Sterling. He handed it in, like drive through He handed it through the window of the, ca the receptionist, and he said, she said, well, what do I do with this? He said, make it sound good. And that was it. And he walked away. And uh, then I had to learn about mastering. And these were the days, of course, of LPs, where this was a nightmare, uh, sonically. How did it help? Because it was about 28 minutes, 29 minutes per side. 
and you weren't supposed to have more than nine. She's great. She's still great. Though. They're both are. Both amazing. Actually, his last meatloaf girl, as I call it, is a great person, too. They have to be, except the tongue. <laughs> the tongue is a big part of the job, <laughs> I tell you. Only working with Gene Simmons would be more <laughs> Oh, mixing. Right, 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 right. Mixing, right. Yeah. Which ought to be a master, uh, drive through master. Right. Yeah, that's right. The mastering of the nature records, the time element. Got it. You have to stop me if you want to. I can just follow a thread. Uh, well, let me see. Let's go, let's go to this one. Because that leads to the Jimmy Iovine thread. And a lot of yeah, what, well, what role did Jimmy Iovine play? He remixed with me. Or you can say his name. Cause I'm yeah. Cause you can say oh, are you ready? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know you were ready. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, after Todd mixed and had the record mastered, it was horrifying for me to meet Love. And again, this doesn't happen with CDs, really. Everything changed with digital. But in those days, if you went over 19 minutes, every extra minute, you'd lose maybe 10, 20 percent of the record. It was logarithmic, the losses. You just, the laws of physics, because you were dealing with vinyl. And so, the record, which, and I, I realized that the whole process of recording is basically step by step a terrible sense of loss that you know it's, it's a lot like life and marriage in that sense <laughs> it starts off so spectacular you got 48 tracks everything's really loud you can make things louder then you have to get 48 tracks down to two tracks for a mix which is very depressing really um, and then from those two tracks you have to make it fit onto the vinyl and you think you're already depressed because what started out like the opening chords of Bad of the Hell sounded originally in the console when you're in a studio like bottom bottom they're huge then you mix it and it's ba -da, ba -da. I said, oh geez well I can't get any louder because there are other instruments that 40 instruments have to share the space of two tracks well really can't be changed oh damn and you get used to that and then you find out when it gets to mastering that it's a 29 minute side it's impossible and it became like da -da, da -da. It sounded like a little toy it was so depressing when we got it home meatloaf and I remember it was in my apartment putting on the record and saying Oh my God, is this what it's ended up? It was like you had this beautiful child that had been turned into a little mutant, awful creature, hunchback creature. And um, we didn't know what to do. I remember we were just crying, basically, about it. And we said we had to do it all again. You know, we couldn't ask Todd. It just Todd didn't have that kind of attention span for it. Even though he, the one, two mixes he did great, we knew were great, but the rest of it. So um, we didn't know who to go to to remix it. And I figured, well, I've got to learn more now. I've got to learn about mixing. So the first person we went to was Jimmy Iovine. And Jimmy Iovine, uh, he's a big deal now. He runs Interscope Records. And he may be one of the biggest guys in the record business. But to me, he'll always be Jimmy. He was always, I knew him when he was basically the assistant recording engineer at the record plant. Um, he was kind of the janitor. He swept up, but he also assisted. And he was around when Springsteen did Born to Run. I think he was like a tape operator who basically went on, off, on, off. But Jimmy's an amazing person. And um, he absorbs like a sponge. And uh, he's always been one of my favorite people. He's very charming, partly because he's so direct. Jimmy, from the day I first knew him, and this is like 76, <clears throat> 76 or 77, he, uh, he always had one goal. He always would say, you know, Steinman, I just, I, I, wanna, I wanna make $100 million. I figured it out, that's how much I need, 100 million. You know, because then you don't have to, you know, I was so happy with 20,000, <laughs> you know, I knew I was fucked up. <laughs> I knew I had to revise my, my estimation. He goes, 100 million, that's the exact amount. He, and he never changed that amount. All the years I knew him and worked with him, he always was looking for the thing that would get him that 100 million. And he had other great comments. He says, you know, the problem with you is you, 
You worry about art and creating art. I worry about buying art. That's what I want to do. And um, he was very pithy and his kind of really bright. And yet, amazing sense of music. And I remember remixing everything with Jimmy. And Jimmy had an easy solution, <laughs> which was totally cheating. But that, you know, that's Jimmy. He, uh, he basically took all the stuff out. You know, because I, he knew what we were saying. Yeah, it sounds small, it should sound huge. It's too many things, you gotta take stuff out. So he took out all the background vocals. He took out almost everything except the piano, bass, and drums. And even the guitar he took out about half of. And so, it, which made it sound a lot like Because of the Night, Patti Smith, that record. Which is a great sounding record, but that's what Jimmy was great at. You know, he says, yeah, he's saying now you just got piano and a voice and the drums, they can all be loud. You know, that's what I want to hear when I hear a song. I want to hear the voice and the melody and the piano and the drums. I, you know, I'll, I'll listen to some guitar, but even those guitars, you know, I think of all those skinny English faggy guys in that satin pants. I don't know about that. I like the other stuff. And um, his father worked on the docks in Brooklyn. He had that kind of mentality. He had a great mixture of vision and also very down to earth. And uh, so his mixes were kind of great because they were loud, but they had nothing in them. They were like really empty. And one of his mixes is left on the album, Two Out of Three Ain't Bad. In fact, it doesn't sound like anything else on the record, I think, because it was a Jimmy mix that I did with Jimmy. And you can tell when you listen to it, a lot's been taken out. The background vocals were put back in, but it's very stark compared to the others, because um, that's the way he mixed. He also is funny. I mean, if you listen really closely to Two Out of Three Ain't Bad, you'll hear when it starts, there's a low hum, a low buzz there before the music starts. You hear, mmm. And I remember mentioning this to him saying, Jimmy, what about this slow hum? I mean, you don't understand about music. You never hear that on the radio. It doesn't pick it up, and no one's going to mention that. Just, you, you're, too, you're much too fanatic. Forget about it. I said, oh, okay. And you have to jump cut again, too. A year later, when the song is on the top 40 station in New York, the top, top 40 station, which is called 99X at the time, and uh, we get a call from the program director saying, you know, we like this song, Two Out of Three in Bad, but there's this horrible hum at the beginning that really comes across on the radio. And so I turn on the radio, and the next time they play the song, I hear, Oh, baby, we can... Jimmy, you little liar. <laughs> and it's still there. Never got rid of it. Um, but uh, and his, uh, Also, I should mention, Jimmy gave me the most profound advice anyone ever gave me in the music business, which I think should be passed along to anyone wanting to be in this business, uh, in that once he did all his mixes, and we only kept one of them, I remixed the rest of the album again with a guy named John Jansen, and those are the ones that the majority of the record. He was brilliant. But I brought them all to Jimmy to listen to, because Jimmy didn't have any ego about it. He, he was just starting out. I mean, I think he had just gotten the job to do Born to Run, which was an accident. No one knew how to mix it, and Jimmy had been there working in the tape machine. They said, why don't you take a crack at it? So one weekend, he tried to, he, he mixed it. And I, I love Born to Run. It's my favorite record of all time, one of them. And um, one of the things I love about it is the way it sounds, which is totally insane and accidental in a way. Jimmy Hill explained to you, he said, I didn't know about echo, I just pushed it all up, and that's why it has all this tunnel-like echo. As someone said, it sounds like it was recorded in the Holland Tunnel. Um, but that's great for, for Born to Run. And um, he left things out. There are really funny stories. I'll get into your show with Springsteen, but like, She's the One, a great song on Born to Run. It's, it's all tom-toms, one of the things that makes it really cool. There's no snare. But that was a mistake. <laughs> Jimmy describes how Springsteen was furious and Max Weimer going, where's the snare? He says, there was a snare? I didn't know. Why don't you write snare? Where? But right there it says SN. Well, I didn't know SN was snare. I thought that was some, you know, code for something. I, I didn't know. Sorry, you know. And the other thing was uh, Clarence Clemens was furious. Uh, not Clarence. Bruce was furious on Jungle Land where he plays a big sax solo. Clarence. It's supposed to be just the accompaniment to a guitar solo. And Bruce was really proud that it was the best guitar solo he would ever play. He worked like days on it. And Jimmy left it out. And he had the same kind of answer. He said, I didn't even know there was guitar. Where does it say guitar? Why do you have the guitar playing with the sax? This is so confusing. I don't want to do this anyway. Leave me alone. <laughs> it's like, but it's, they kept it all. It's a great record. Um, but Jimmy's advice to me that I thought was so precious was um, I brought all these mixes to play him. And I played it and he listened to everyone. He's listening really carefully. And I'm thinking, ah. Trained ears. This is a guy who doesn't know a lot more than I do, but to me, he was like a, a god because he had done more than I had. Everyone had done more than I had with some kind of god. And so I said, What do you think, Jimmy? What do you think of these mixes? And then he looked at me and he goes, um, You know something, Steinman? I'll pay you something. These mixes, the ones you just played me that I just heard, these mixes are going to sound great on the radio. And I thought, this is important. I should really remember this. It's going to be something about EQ or something really about sonics and how voices, I've got to know this for the radio. Well, what is it to me? Why are they going to sound great on the radio? 
Because they're on the damn radio, you know how hard it is to get on the goddamn radio? If it's on the radio, it'll sound great. That's the whole point. Get it on the radio. Then don't care. It's going to sound great because it's on the radio. It's the best practical advice I can tell anyone. <laughs> don't worry about how it sounds, but when it gets on the radio, it's going to sound great. Um, so, Jimmy, um, I had to give my pearls. I also I just should add for color that he had, he had so many wonderful statements that I, should, I feel like honoring Jimmy for a second. He, um, he did say to me... Um, Years later, in about 83, when I was doing other stuff like Total Eclipse of the Heart and things, he would call me from L.A., and uh, MTV had just begun. And Jimmy calls me uh, one day, and he says, Diamond, put on MTV. Put it on immediately. And he put it on, uh, it's Pat Benatar, who is the 80s song, uh, big female singer, who had this video called Love is a Battlefield. And it was right after Michael Jackson did um, Thriller and Beat and all that. And so there was dance. Everyone was doing big dance sequences and videos, which was new. And she couldn't dance at all. She was there basically moving her booze back and forth and trying to do it in time. <laughs> and that was all it was. And Jimmy says, look at this woman. Look at Pat Benatar. Look at her. And I was looking at it at the same time he was. He goes, can you believe it? I mean, she's trying to dance. This girl can't even stand still in time, <laughs> which I thought was a great comment. And... Uh, the, these, I, I should do the collected wisdom of Jimmy, I mean, because there are a lot of them. I remember when I did Streets of Fire, this movie with him. It was classic. He did the whole movie as the music supervisor. He didn't really know what he was doing. But it was another thing where he said to me, you know what I am? I'm a music supervisor for a big movie. You think this will get me the $100 million? I don't know. It seems like a movie's the way to do it. I said, could be, you know. Meanwhile, he didn't know. I knew the script because the title song, Streets of Fire, is Bruce Springsteen. And John Landa was going to be my manager at that point. So I knew John. And I knew the script. I saw it on his desk. And I asked him about it. He said, oh, it's a piece of crap. They wanted to use Bruce's song. We won't give him it. No, no way. It's a bad script. So I said, can I read it? He said, yeah. So I read the script. It was a terrible script. But I, I mentioned that. And it was Joel Silver, a big movie producer's first movie. So I met all these people for the first time. Joel Silver, who was a maniac. And um, I was the one who, I was out in LA the whole time because I was doing Footloose, too. Two movies. And Footloose, I was sure it was going to be a disaster. I didn't even care about it. And that was a hit. And I thought Streets of Fire would be the biggest thing of all time. It was a big flop, even though it's become a cult movie. And it's a cool movie to watch. And it was cool because Steven Spielberg would come to the set every day because he's considered the director, Walter Hill, to be the best action director in the, in the world. And that's amazing action with motorcycles. But I learned a lot. And one of the things that was interesting was Jimmy goes, um, I don't know what to do as a music supervisor, but, you know, I think this is going to be the way to get $100 million. You know, I really do. And I'd say, but what about the script, Jimmy? You know, it really stinks. He says, the script? Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's that important. And Joel was there, and he says, Joel, what do you think? Is the script any good? The script? I don't know if the script's any good. It's not about that. It's about the visuals. What do you see? The action, the visuals. This movie's about visuals. It's about excitement. It's about thrills. Yeah, don't worry about the script. I remember mentioning it to like six or seven people that the script was trashy, and I always got the same answer. Script? I'm sure no one read the script. <laughs> like, the script doesn't matter. This movie's about visuals. It's an action. It's like a Spielberg movie. So, all right. And then we go to the first, the first edit, the first cut of the movie in the screening room, and it's Iveen, me, and Joel Silver. We're all sitting there, we're watching. We're all excited to see the first cut, and it starts. And, and I remember Joel Silver, who impressed me. Joel Silver goes, "Here we go. The adventure begins." <laughs> it was like we were like three little kids. And Iveen goes, "Yeah, this is it. Time. Hundred million dollars. Hundred million dollars. I know it." And it starts. And about twenty minutes into the movie, Jimmy turns to me and he goes, "Simon." You know about art and that kind of stuff, movies, theater, right? I said, well, yeah, I know something. He says, this movie is really shitty, isn't it? It's really bad. I said, yeah, it's a really bad script. I said, why didn't anyone notice that the script was bad? It's, it stings. I can't even watch it. I'm never going to make $100 million from this movie. And Joel's on the other side going, what am I going to do next? It's got to be a next project. And then <laughs> sitting there and... Uh, uh, there were so many lessons I learned during that movie. It went $14 million over budget, I think. And I kept saying to Joel, how are they allowing this? Because they kept screaming at us. It's over budget. And I said, how? And they, you got to understand, they built all, Walter Hill didn't want to go to Chicago. It sort of took place in Chicago. So they built Chicago in L.A. They built this enormous elevated train, the city of Chicago, and a, the biggest tarp ever for, uh, to cover an outdoor area. Two square miles of tarp that covered all of Chicago. And I remember saying to Joel, how can they let you go $14 million over budget? And Joel says, you got a lot to learn about Hollywood. you got a lot to learn. Come over here. Let me show you something. He, t he goes to the tarp. He says, two, two square miles, square tarp, right? I said, yeah, biggest tarp ever created. I read that. He says, take a look. Op open that flap. And I open the flap. He says, what does it say? I said, property of Superior Hardware, California. You know who owns Superior Hardware? Universal. 
take a look at it. And he took me all around and said, everything, of course, was owned by Universal, and they were paying extra rentals to the company that was financing the movie. It was a good lesson about Hollywood, um, why things go over budget. Um, from Joel himself, the master of it. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, and the funniest thing was they couldn't use the Springsteen song in the end, Streets of Fire. So um, I had to write another song. And, and Jimmy ended up, he's such a cool guy and such a master what he does that he blamed me for them not having the final song. They were convinced they'd have the Springsteen song. I remember them saying, um, we're definitely going to have a Springsteen song, right, Jimmy? Says, yeah, are you kidding? It's a cinch. I'm, I'm that close with Bruce. I did want to run. I know John Lando. I'll, if I have to, I'll make a call to Walter Yednikoff, the president. I know what to do. It's about people, connections. It's like one week later, Steinman, I'm screwed. Springsteen, what an idiot. He won't give me Streets of Fire. We don't have any ending for the movie. We, you got to come up with a song like in two days. So I wrote this song that I loved, and I, I sent it to them. And, he, and, and Joel, I remember, left me a great message saying, I hate you, you bastard. I love this song. We're going to have to do it. And we're going to have to rebuild the Wiltern Theater, which they had taken down. It was a million dollars to redo the ending, just the ending of the Streets of Fire, because they didn't have the, they had already filmed Bruce Springsteen's song. And they spent a million dollars, and I felt all this hostility for Universal. And a guy named Sean Daniel, who was head of production, one day said to me, well, there is hostility because we understand, you know, you waited about eight months to come up with that final song, and you never did. I said, where'd you hear that? I did it in two days at Jimmy Iovine. So I went to Jimmy Iovine, and I, I said all that to him. He says, yeah, it's true, I know. I, I blamed you, but you know, you can't, I, you can't be upset with me. I, I'm not like a writer. I gotta, you know, I gotta make my way with these people. I had to have the scapegoat. I thought it was like honoring you to make you the scapegoat. You're not really mad, are you? I said, no, I guess not. He said, good, yeah, because we had a lot of work to do together. <laughs> I didn't mind it. It was always like when I went to see him in L.A. when he was first starting Interscope, he had just moved into the offices. I know I'm off topic, but what the hell. <laughs> he, I, he moved into the, uh, his offices in Interscope, and he said, Steinman, sit in that chair right there. And he made me sit like exactly. In one. He said, don't move to the left. No, don't move to the right. Sit there. Don't, that, right there. Just keep it right there. Now, now don't move. I'm going to play something. This is going to freak you out. It's called Q Sound. $100 million, I'm telling you, $100 million. Listen to this, you're gonna hear Madonna singing in your right ear and crawling around your right ear, behind your head to your left ear. Wait till you hear this, don't move, don't move. I gotta talk to Arnold Schwarzenegger on the phone, so I'll be busy, but just listen to this. He puts on Madonna, and she's doing what he said, and it finishes, he says, what do you think, it's pretty amazing. I said, I hate that. You hate it? I said, I don't want Madonna crawling around my ear and around the back of my head, I just don't want it. It's not sanitary, and it's not particularly aesthetically pleasing. And he goes, Oh, you don't think this will be a hundred million dollars? I said, I don't think so. He says, I don't know, maybe this endoscope jump will work out. <laughs> so, and as I understand it, he, he made more than a hundred million, so he did good. But he was, um, he was, a, he was a big part of it too, though. He, his little words of advice and things, it was all part of an evolution to get that album sounding right. It'd be great if we already shot a Jimmy Iovine behind the music. Yeah. Half hour. Uh, um, my wife. My wife's a business manager who used to work with him, and I think that was exactly what she heard, too. It was all about $100 million. Oh, you know, he had, it was great that he had a specific figure. He really knew. He, he knew finances in a way I never would have. You do a very great, a great gym. I know Jimmy really well. And that, that I'm sort of toning it down. You could do a one-man show. <laughs> Jimmy, I mean, on tour. You're Mark Stein. Twain. You could be like Al Holbrook touring around. <laughs> what are you doing? I, uh, when he Except heard it. Marquee. Yeah, I think it was. He, he, Roy tells the story. He heard the mixed record, and he threw it in a swimming pool. He was so horrified at what he heard. Um, he thought it was all like, you know, he thought the tempos were terrible, the aid of the performances, the mix, and um, just didn't like it at all. And I think it's just too brilliant, you know. But, but it's brilliant partly because Jimmy didn't know what he was doing. It's just like, I think Bad Health probably brilliant because I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, you know, you just don't know what you're doing, so you do things, you know, intuitively, which is uh, rare, which is actually, yeah, it's very hard to do that. Are we ready? Uh -huh. We're willing. Um, let's get back remotely on track yeah. with, to uh, Steve Van Zandt, actually another uh, blues associate, played a role in getting, in finally getting a record deal for this record, is that true? Boy, not that I know of. That he didn't say was the best, if he called, I don't know oh, if he called Oh, with Popovich? Popovich yeah. He might have, that I wouldn't, I might not know about. Okay, well, I'll have to deal, get that from him. Yeah. Um, but let's talk in one more, just Todd, in addition to everything else we've discussed, didn't Todd, in essence, fund this project? In a way, yeah, what happened was, <clears throat> after being turned down by every record company in existence, we ended up getting a deal with Tomato Records. That shows you. We went from the big companies to the vegetable family. And we were with, or is it a fruit, tomato? I don't know. Uh, but we were with Tomato Records, which was a company distributed by RCA. Now, there's a fruity vegetable company. And um, 
that was our deal, tomato records. And we thought, we finally got a deal. We don't care if it's tomato, turnip, radish, whatever. We're on a record deal. And um, we were happy until it turned out they wouldn't accept Todd as the producer. He was the only producer who was willing to do it. And um, they, they didn't like him because he'd done War Babies, an album with Hole and Oates, which I actually think is their best album. But it was experimental. It got away from their tried and true formulas in the 70s. So they didn't like Todd. They thought he was too avant-garde or something. And so they refused Todd as producer. And we didn't have anyone else. No one else would touch it. Um, so we had to get out of our deal with uh, Tomato Records. And I remember that was funny. That was Sonnenberg orchestrated it. He was good at these sort of things. We all got together at this steakhouse, Smith & Walensky's in New York, um, which I think was near the office David had at the time. And um, David prepared us. It was me, meat, love, and him. He said, now here's what happens. Kevin Eggers, the president, is coming in. What's going to happen is we're going to have to be really good about this, like actors. We're going to have to put in a real scene. Like, we're not going to be on your label. We won't do it. We won't do it without Todd. That's it. That's the only way to work. You have to really be explosive. You have, I'll throw the first fit, and then I'll walk out. Then Meatloaf, you have to throw a fit, and then you and Jim walk out and leave him there alone. He know he won't get a record. He'll let us out of the deal. We'll just need 25000 you know, to pay him off. And that's, you got to do this. You got to pull this off. Don't give it away. And he's like, all right, all right, fine. So he comes in and he starts this very pleasant, he says, well, I have great plans for this record. You know, it's going to make Tomato the biggest fruit label in the world and whatever he was talking about. And, and we're there talking and David starts his fit. You know, well, we're not going to be on Tomato. Why not? You won't accept Todd Rungan, you know, basically accelerating. He goes, and we've had it. We can't stand it. We've had it. Good. I, I can't talk to you. I'm, I'm, damn you, I'm leaving. And David walks out. So it's me, those turns. He says, I didn't, I didn't work all these years for nothing. I didn't do this. I'm not putting up with you. You know, Jim and I have had it, and I, I'm leaving. And somehow in this, I missed my cue. So I'm left at the table with Kevin Eggers, this, this guy. He's looking at me saying, well, at least you're still here. And I'm thinking, wow, it's not a really good time for me to make a dramatic exit. I couldn't say, and I hate your cologne. <laughs> I had no cue. So I ended up there talking for like 40 minutes trying to explain to him that we couldn't do the record without Todd. Anyway, it worked because in the end, the combination, he said he'd let us out of the deal for 25000 which unfortunately we got by me giving away my publishing <laughs> for the whole bat of hell for $25,000. So I never got uh, publishing on that. And um, th actually, it's the only thing I share in common with the great legendary blues singers uh, is that I really, and me love too, we've never been paid on that record, basically. Uh, we were paid on about 4 million copies, and it sold like 40 plus million. And it was um, because, well, well, I signed my publishing away in Meatloaf, and I got screwed on the actual record royalties. Because i never clear on this, but he went bankrupt like the third year after it was out. And they used that as a loophole, I think, CBS, to not pay him. Because once he's bankrupt, he owed them things. I don't, I don't even understand it to this day. It went on for 25 years uh, to get a settlement. Um, but we ended up being basically screwed out of, you know, zillions of dollars. So that's the only thing. It's obnoxious to say, but that's the one thing I share in common with Blind Lemon Jefferson or Blind Lemon Pledge, whoever it is. And um, so financially, it's not what people think it was. It wasn't a bonanza. But um, we got off Tomato Records, and Todd started doing the record without a record company. Basically for Bearsville, so to speak, but they didn't pay him anything. So Todd funded the record. It was about 75000 The record ended up costing, I think, 135 to 140 <coughs> About uh, yeah. <clears throat> about 140000 I, I think, when it was over. But I know that certainly the first 75000 and probably more after that, was covered by Todd. And he was really at risk for it. And that's why it was so catastrophic when the record was finished, and you think it's done, that Warner Brothers stopped working with Bearsville or something, and they said, we have to hear it as a live audition. And then they turned it down. And so we had no record coming again, and we had a finished record. The same exact record, by the way, fully mixed, that sold 40-plus million, was the one turned down by Warner Brothers. Um, and Lenny Warrinker, who uh, was a hero of mine. Um, where is he now? DreamWorks. Well, he's still a hero of mine at DreamWorks, whatever they do over there. And um, so we had, we had to find a new label, and we didn't know where to go. We, we had used up everything. We had been turned down by CBS four different times. Like every label, Epic, Columbia. It was like CBS had labels they didn't even know about that turned us down. Probably Sony, Sony I say Sony because it's Sony now, it was CBS then. Probably the classical division turned us down. They'd give us to anyone. Everyone would turn us down. And uh, we always wanted to be on Epic because I liked the name. Epic was the coolest name. But they, they were the first to turn us down. And all of a sudden, David calls me and says, uh, you know, we might have a chance here. There's this guy named Steve Popovich. And he used to run A&R at Epic. And he was actually a genius at A&R. He's the guy who signed so many of their biggest acts. 
Uh, I think he signed Jackson 5 and Michael Jackson and Sly and the Family Stone and all these big acts from the 70s were signed by Steve Popovich. Great man, great music man, great record man, great human being. Still lives in Cleveland. And he had this little company they gave him when he left A&R called Cleveland International. What is a great name? Cleveland International. <laughs> it's a, like delusions of grandeur in the very name. <laughs> it's like Toledo Universal. And um, so he's, uh, except Cleveland is the greatest rock and roll city, I have to admit. And when we were there, they were one of the first to play it, MMS. And, and he, he was just one of these things that you hear about in a fairy tale. He was one of the true believers. He heard the record and didn't need to know anything else. And as I was told, and this may connect to when you say Steve Van was involved, Pavlovich's comment I got was that all I had to hear was the introduction to you took the words right out of my mouth. The best introduction in rock and roll I've ever heard. And that's about 12 seconds. And he loved that introduction. And uh, I'm sure he listened to the rest, but that's what I remember. That's when he decided to buy the record. And that's apparently what Steve Van Zandt had called him to say. It took the best 25 seconds of that record. Really? In well, then, history. well, then we owe Steve Van Zandt a lot. Right? See, I didn't even know that. I do remember he was involved somehow, but I didn't know that. So thank you, Steve. <laughs> that's great he said that. And, um, and so Popovich is the one who saved us. He brought it in as Cleveland International because CBS couldn't turn it down then. He had the right to sign it. It was sort of assumed that we would sell nothing, you know, except 10 copies in Cleveland. Um, all the time we're doing the record, Popovich is saying, you gotta write me some polkas. Because he also had this guy, Frankie Yank Yankovic, who's the biggest polka artist in the world, <laughs> who's also in Cleveland International, who would do like seven albums a year. Like polkas for April, polkas for June, polkas for July, and then he'd go back next year and do polkas for May, the months he missed, <laughs> polkas for Sunday. You know, he did 100 polka albums. That was his other big artist, so he's telling me, you gotta do a polka album. He just loved whatever music, and he, he was very Eastern European background. And he's the one I, I, I was very proud of. He, he told, one day he comes to me as a personal favor. He says, you got to write a song for my grandparents. They're real old country. They're from the old country, Russia. you got to write a song for them that they'd like. I said, I don't know. I, I can't write Russian. He says, you know, it's like Dr. Zhivago. They use that balalaika thing that sounds like a lute. Oh, write something. Come on, write something. So I wrote this song. Uh, it's only rock and roll balalaika. <laughs> I was very proud of it. It was for Steve Popovich's grandparents. And... Um, Popovich is the one who, like, it was amazing, again, a great lesson in the record industry. If you have one believer, you can get much further than you can with all of Sony or all of Warner Brothers sort of having some interest. You have to have one fanatic believer, and this guy was a fanatic believer. And all he did was have faith in it, and he built it step by step with, like, NEW, one station in New York, one station in Cleveland, and he believed, as I did, that if people heard it, it would catch on. I had no idea it would take about a year to catch on in America. It was one of the strangest stories ever for a record. It became huge overseas before America. In fact, it's the first record I think ever that sold, an American record, that sold something like five million overseas before it even sold 400,000 or so here. Um, we were like platinum in 12 countries overseas and no one even knew who we were here. And it was surreal when we were touring we would be playing places in like Toledo and suburbs of Cleveland. They were always in that area around Cleveland. Um, these little dumps that were, it was great gigs, the audience were great, but dumps. And, um, and then I remember one specifically we were playing, which I think was Toledo, where um, it was dripping, there was liquid dripping on my head. I was playing a really bad piano and this liquid's dripping on my head. And I said to the guy, I finally got someone's attention during the show, and I said, you know, this water is dripping on my head. Is it raining? Can you do something about it? He says, oh, it's not water. It's not rain. Don't worry about it. It's just the plumbing from the toilet. I said, oh, that's reassuring. At least it's bodily fluid. That's not... Uh. And, um, and that was one of the worst nights. It was a typical gig. And the next day, I'm not exaggerating, the next day we flew to Australia and we were met in Melbourne, Australia by about 10,000 people. It was so big in Australia that it knocked Saturday Night Fever off the charts as number one. It's still one of the biggest records of all time, if not the biggest in Australia. And um, we got there, and there was like thousands at the airport. It was one of those Beatles things. We, they, we were delirious. It, was, you know, it felt like a four-week flight. And we get out, and we could hardly move. And all of a sudden, it's a press conference. Like you always see the Beatles with a Pan Am logo behind them. And they're asking this question. And I'm thinking, well, oh God, I'm supposed to be witty like John Lennon or something. I was an idiot. <laughs> we could barely talk English. And um, luckily, in Australia, they don't talk English, so it didn't matter. But um, we, we did that, and then we had a convoy of Hell's Angels that took us into the hotel from the airport. 
like 100 Hells Angels on this convoy. And it was on the evening news. It was the second biggest story. Um, Meatloaf has the newspaper, by the way. It's a great newspaper to see because OPEC was the biggest story. The oil prices, they're having a big conference there. And the second biggest story was Meatloaf's arrival. And the next night we did our concert, and of course, he collapsed. And they have this huge headline, Meatloaf's colla Meatloaf Collapse Shock. And there's a big picture of him collapsed. And it's the big headline. And in smaller print, OPEC raises oil prices for the world. So, and then, you know, after about a week, we're back in the little town in um, Dayton, Ohio, with urine coming on my head. And it was totally schizoid. It took forever in America. And it was really interesting that it didn't take forever overseas. And uh, I always found it amazing because uh, I was amazed they could understand the lyrics because there's so many puns and wordplay and things like that. But they totally got it. it Germany. To this day, the, the, the country that the album sold the most in per capita, this is cool, is Finland. Um, no, Iceland, excuse me, even more obscure, it's Iceland. That's, that's the one that Reykjavik's the capital, right? Yeah, because one night we actually got the opera in Reykjavik and we were asking her the population of the country <laughs> just to find out what it was like. It sold, um, it's the equivalent of 50 times platinum in Reykjavik. I don't, I don't think they give you like a special, pla I think they give you a, um, like an impaled polar bear or something on a plaque. But um, mathematically, they said it works out that every home in Iceland has 10 copies of <laughs> Bad in the Hell. I don't really know how they can figure this out, but it's just an absurd amount of copies in Iceland. I remember, I never got to go there. I remember asking Meat years later, what was it like playing in Iceland, Meat? He said, oh, Iceland, it's wild. I said, I imagine it's a really enchanted country. Like, it's the world of like elves and fairies and like magic and sorceries. Really? I don't know, my main memory is that you play a big open space, there's like 100,000 kids there, and they're all vomiting and pissing through the whole show. They're just vomiting and pissing, vomiting and pissing. I said, yeah, well, I guess elves and sorcerers do that too. I guess I could reconcile that discrepancy. But that was my image. It will always be that of Iceland, of <laughs> a huge crowd of kids pissing and vomiting. Um, but uh, it just took off overseas far before it took off, especially in England. It was huge in England. America, I've always...